It is Wednesday night, East Lansing, Michigan. Come on in, gather around, gather around, gather around. My name is Jim Comfort, publisher, SpartanMag.com. Thanks for joining us on a Wednesday afternoon. A little bit late getting started today. Apologize about that. Was working to get some things uh, together, you know, doing some phone calls, doing a little bit extra research here and there. Sometimes we're not able to go on there exactly when we want to. We appreciate those that are hanging with us. And um, come on in, uh, gather around. I don't know what beverages you might be partaking in on a Wednesday afternoon. That's your business. I'm not here to judge. You do whatever you need to do. Michigan State football coaching search underway. You know, news came today that uh, Bruce Feldman from The Athletic reported that he had spoken with Urban Meyer, and Urban Meyer told him that he is not interested in the Michigan State job. That is news. To some people, that's like a non-story. It was, some people think that that was never going to be a story, never was a story. Actually, um, you know, there were some factions in motion uh, doing some fact-finding in that direction with some initial interest. Some ears were listening on the other side, on the Urban Meyer side is what I've heard from good sources. <clears throat> there were factions, more importantly, there were factions of Michigan State that were uh, interested in moving that forward. But uh, Feldman's story seems to put that to rest. I take it at, fa- at face value. A lot of people are like, well, you know, coaches always deny that there's interest. And that's true when they are employed at certain schools or any school or any professional job. You deny and you say, I'm not interested or I'm happy where I am right now. That's what you normally say. There's no reason for Urban Meyer to say that because he's not employed with the team right now. So he could say, if he were interested, he would probably say, Bruce, you know, don't even ask me about that. You know, go away, whatever. But uh, I'm I'm sure that that Urban Meyer probably wanted that out there. Otherwise, Bruce Feldman wouldn't have gone with it. So in in my opinion, that ends that speculation. And um, in in my professional opinion, as a a news reporter, I thought that there was – I had – a lot of indications that there there were um, that that story was worth pursuing, but not anymore because sometimes things like that um, come to an to an abrupt end for one reason or another. But anyway, come on and gather around. Let's see what we have here. We've got. Uh, by the way, my name is Jim Comfort, publisher of SpartanMag.com. You can find our work over at SpartanMag.com. If you like this program, give us a like, subscribe to the channel, and also if you like uh, the video that we have uh, from Michigan State's press conferences throughout the course of the week. Go ahead and give us a like. We appreciate that. Coverage yesterday, Michigan State Media Day, ongoing, continuing at SpartanMag.com. We've got video here on this website. More video to come. Got some practice clips from yesterday's practice a little bit. We'll be airing that today. That's one of the reasons we're a little bit late getting started today. I was loading that video, and it looks like it's going to take. It's going to work. Last week, we tried to run some video. It didn't quite work. Uh, Changed some things about the size of that file, and I think it's going to work now. We won't see last week's clips. We'll run those at a different time. Hopefully my voice holds up. That's always a problem. <clears throat> so we'll see how that goes. Uh, we field que- how this works is over at SpartanMag.com. We field questions. I field questions. We, our staff, we field questions. We open it to SpartanMag.com subscribers. We ask them to field to uh, post questions, mailbag style. We will answer them here. Um, and uh, we appreciate everybody at SpartanMag.com, all our subscribers over there that post and those that don't post and those that uh, contribute here to the, to the mailbag session, which we have a lot of fun with uh, when we do Spartan Mag Live. If you don't know what SpartanMag.com is, go over there, check it out. We've been covering Michigan State sports since the advent of the Internet, been having a great time with it. Appreciate the great support we have for Michigan State fans out there that, that, uh, that want Michigan State sports news coverage and conversation all the time that's what we provide at spartanmag.com especially over at the underground bunker message board that's where we talk about michigan state sports all the time every minute anything breaks that's what we're talking about breaking it down as long as i'm near a computer which is usually but sometimes i'm out there living my life a little bit um but uh, usually uh someone at spartanmag.com is there quick with um Thoughts about any news that breaks and also breaking news at SpartanMag.com underground bunker message board, which is the church of what's happening now with Michigan State sports, the the daily narrative on Michigan State sports. And that is where we post uh, the mailbag invitation for SpartanMag.com subscribers to post questions. We will get to those here momentarily. We were hoping to have Paul Konerdike on to talk about Michigan State basketball. I was at practice today. I watched every minute of the practice. It was interesting. Spoke with Izzo a little bit afterward as well. Of course, Izzo spoke for about an hour during the media day press conferences. And uh, you can find that video here on this channel. Uh, interesting to watch practice yesterday. I was hoping to talk to Paul a little bit about basketball and what he thought, but he's not able to join us. Maybe we'll get to him later in the week or maybe next week. Well, certainly a lot of time before Michigan State kicks off the exhibition against Tennessee at the end of this month. That's going to be interesting to see what Michigan State has. A lot of people have the Spartans as a top 10 preseason team, maybe even top five. I would agree with that. 
Michigan State looks pretty good. Not perfect at this point, but they look pretty good. All right, so question number one, Marlowe from Grand Blank, Michigan. So also, if you've got questions, if you have questions, go ahead and post them over in the comments area. We will get to those as well, and we will open the phone line to take some questions. I'll go ahead and do that right now. Let me see if I can find that. But first, let's take Marlowe's question from Grand Blank. He says, first things first, Marlowe from Grand Blank. He's a post over at SpartanMag.com. He says, first things first, let's talk quarterback. Where are we at and where should we be in the pecking order at the quarterback position? Um, I know that Marlowe has some thoughts on this. He posted at the Underground Bunker Message Board. I think he thinks Michigan State should move on from Noah Kim. I respect that opinion. Um, I would think, you know, first of all, first of all, I think that um, Noah Kim showed a lot of potential in the first two games. A lot of that arm talent that we've been hearing about made some really pretty throws. Ball really came out nicely in a lot of ways. Defense has got tougher against Washington and Iowa. Maybe not as tough against Maryland. Maryland was the problem with the turnovers. And uh, Washington, problem with pass protection. He was beaten up, and he reacted adversely to that. And I'm not judging, because I don't know what it's like to sit back there and get hit by 300-pound dudes all afternoon. So he, that's part of his learning experience, to become a, a quarterback. We've seen quarterbacks over the years, and what they have to go through to learn how to play the position. Part of it is getting reacclimated to getting hit. And this is a guy that didn't get hit first first three years on campus for the most part so that was new for him and, and, and in addition to all the other newness that comes with that position and I've seen young young quarterbacks struggle early on and then become good quarterbacks later Jim Miller Kirk Cousins NFL guys so Tony Banks 1994 is a Juco had some ups and downs 94 no one thought he was an NFL guy necessarily 94 had a great arm came back in 95 had some good moments got drafted NFL career anyway they learn as they go. We've seen that. So Maryland game, I think there were still some elements of the shell shocking from the Washington game affected him there. Now, if Michigan State were a stable program with a lot of good talent around him and things were going well in a stable coaching staff, he's the type of talented quarterback, if you were a sophomore with this talent, that you would ride it out. Um, and you would see progress, I think, at some point. I think we saw some progress. I thought he stayed in the pocket a little bit better in the Iowa game. Now, a lot of people were really frustrated about the way Noah Kim played late in that game because of the ineffectiveness of the offense late in the third quarter into the fourth quarter. Now, at that time, Michigan State had a lead, and they're playing a very dangerous Iowa team in terms of a team that will turn you over. And low-scoring game, Kim had already thrown a couple interceptions. <clears throat> it was clear to me that Michigan State, <clears throat> this is not going to work, I don't think. I really apologize. I'm going to try to keep going with my voice. It's been bad all week. I'm not sure what's going on. I do have an appointment coming up in a couple of weeks. I'm going to get some things looked at. But anyway, I've kind of had that uh, voice problem for a number of years. So we'll, we'll see what's going on. But And I appreciate those of you that have reached out that have given me advice on how to take care of this. And I've done some things earlier today to try to do some things. Not all of the things, but... Um, I thought we were ready to go, but it's uh, it's not working that great, my voice. Anyway, um, as far as Noah Kim goes, th at the end of the Iowa game, or in the end of the fourth quarter, Michigan State was obviously trying to take care of the ball. Do not throw an interception. Iowa specializes in forcing turnovers. Noah Kim has had problems with turnovers. Michigan State has the lead. Iowa's offense is not good. Do not do them any favors. If nothing's there, throw it out of bounds. I think a lot of Michigan State fans saw him throwing it out of bounds, and they took that to mean that Noah Kim is ineffective, always will be ineffective. Um, no, that's not the case, necessarily. I'm not guaranteeing he's going to be great down the road, but do not misconstrue what was going on in the fourth quarter of the Iowa game as Michigan State was trying to protect a lead as to Noah Kim's ceiling of potential or long-term deficiencies. He was following the game plan. And I can't argue with the game plan because it's exactly what we talked about in the pre-snap read. Iowa is dangerous. Noah Kim can't yet quite be trusted against the de defense like that. Stop the Iowa run. Establish the Michigan State run. Don't turn it over. Make Iowa beat you. Punt. Made up, make Iowa beat you with their offense. Punt. And that's what Michigan State did. They got the lead 16-10. to 10, Became conservative. Some of you get the hives when people talk about conservatism in football 
But against that defense, with that quarterback in that situation, against that offense, that was the right thing to do. Punt it, you know, try to get first downs. If not, punt it back to them, make them go the length of the field. And that was working until they had two bad punts. The 15-yard shank led to a field goal. And then the game is tied. Incompletion. Punt return, touchdown. Misdirection on the punt. Directional punt was supposed to go left, went right. Touchdown return. Eckley's a very good punter. I mean, he's, he's had a pretty good season. Had a very good day that day up until those two punts. I don't mean to pile it out all on him. But the strategy, the conservatism, keeping tight reins on Noah Kim after the first two interceptions, that was all working. It was all on schedule until those two punts. Now, they'll play Rutgers, a decent defense, not as good as Iowa. Will we see Noah Kim play quarterback against Rutgers? <clears throat> I'm not so sure. I think Arlen Barnett, after the game, was asked about the quarterback situation, and he said, we will look at that, which is different than what he said after the Maryland game. After the Maryland game, he said, Noah Kim is our quarterback, even though we took him out in the fourth quarter of the Maryland game, he is our quarterback. This time, he didn't do that. He didn't say that. He said they would talk about it. It's a bye week. They got two weeks to practice and work in a new quarterback. It would not surprise me if that's the case. I've not heard that for sure, but it wouldn't surprise me if they start Caden Hauser. In the meantime, Harlan Barnett has basically been notified that he's not going to be the coach next year. Call from Oh To accept, press 1. To send a voicemail, press 2. All right, let's go out to uh, Austin, Texas, by way of the Seaway Conference in Ludington, Michigan, bring in our old friend, Old Tuck. He's a uh, longtime uh Long time, uh, long time listener here at Spartan Mag Live, and he's a Spartan Mag subscriber. I'm going to bring him in. I appreciate I appreciate him offering to check in off the bench, even though I didn't open up the phone lines officially. But I'll bring him in because you've seen I'm laboring here with the with the voice. And I think Old Tuck wants to help me out a little bit. I appreciate that. We've been talking about the quarterback situation at Michigan State a little bit, but let's go out to Texas and see what Old Tuck's got to say. Are you calling from Texas, Old Tuck? Yep, I'm on my way back to work here. I'm on my lunch break. Well, make sure you get work. Make sure you get work. Your, get your work done. We don't want you pulling a Mel Tucker here, my man. Come on, what are you doing? How are you doing? Getting, getting your job. Well, done? yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> sorry about yeah, that. I'm on my way back. I'm on my way back to Dell. You know, we uh, we work remote a little bit and in the office a little bit, so I'm on my way back to nice. sell some uh, servers and computers. All right, what's on your mind? Uh, a few things. Number one, as a reporter, are you going to be there tomorrow outside waiting for uh, Mel and uh, and the and the honorage to come in for their hearing? I don't think Mel. I don't think, I don't think Mel Tucker's no. going to um, be at the hearing, and you may want to turn down okay. your, your. I don't. You may want to turn your, down your computer a little bit so I don't get some feedback. Uh, you know, Tucker has kind of indicated that he that he and his uh, his attorneys are not thrilled with some portions of the investigation and the hearing which some people take as a precursor that he will not be there personally i don't know for sure but i'm not expecting him to be there okay all right uh i just had so one other question it's not football related i you know the urban meyer talk to me i mean i just don't see it i think if he's going to go somewhere else he wants to go to a place that can bring in a bunch of talent quickly most likely in the south um, you know, I just don't, I just don't see it. I, I get that he wanted to come when he was at Bowling Green or whatever, but that was 20, 25 mm -hmm. years ago when he was trying to ascend. So, uh, I, I don't think that's happening. I think we need to move on from that. Um, Izzo yesterday gave a real nice, you know, uh, press conference there, covered a lot of stuff. My question for you is, if Malik Hall, and you mentioned something about his shot a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. if he's not able to stick the 17-foot jumper with consistency like Goins mm -hmm. and Tillman and Granger mm -hmm. and all the guys, do you think we could see Kohler slide in there at some point to the four uh, this year? And, and I have a feeling Kohler's going to be able to make consistent jump shots by the uh, – by the end of the year, judging by what I saw last year. Great questions. And Great. I was watching, I was watching um, Malik Carr very closely yesterday. And, you know, his shot, you know, he's still working back into it last week. Had, you know, looked a little, little different. I mentioned that. A little hitch to it. Yeah. The hitch was a little bit ironed out yesterday. And I will say this, and I mentioned this to Izzo after practice yesterday. 
Um, Malik Carr shot better than any player on the team in yesterday's practice. He shot really okay. well. Came out well. Rotation was tight, good, and he didn't disagree. I'm not saying he's the best shooter on the team. I'm saying that particular day he shot better than anybody else. And I'm, I'm a little reluctant to say something like that because we are not really supposed to report what we see in some regards. You know, we're not supposed to say he was he was 10 out of 12 from three-point range for the day. We can't say things like that. But I'm comfortable in saying that he, he shot well yesterday. Now, he's still he's, – I talked to him about his – his um, – his uh, – excuse me for a second. I got a little feedback there. I, I talked to him a little bit about, about his health. You know, he, he was playing with a hurt foot for most of last year. And um, – it bothered him. He had he had surgery. He feels better now. So now he's getting his the the technique and the fundamentals back in place, and he feels good about that. He's excited, but there's a confidence thing there that needs to be worked back in. And Izzo's working on his confidence. You know, um, yeah. Malik Hall even Malik Hall brought brought it up that it was some physical problems, some physical health, and some mental health situations also. So you know he's had some problems with health in his family, his father, and so forth. So he's had to he's had to work on a lot of things. He shot really well yesterday, and I think it's a, an interesting comparison when you mention Kenny Goins or the AJ Granger type, you know, making three pointers. The importance of the stretch four in the Michigan State offense, and really all offenses in, in basketball these days, very important. You mentioned Tillman also, and Xavier Tillman, his junior year, they worked on him with perimeter shooting, and he didn't get off to a great start that year shooting from the perimeter. So they kind of canceled that. They ended that yeah. experiment. You know, Marcus Bingham had some chances to shoot from three and they kind of canceled that, you know, you get some chances early on. If you don't make some threes, then they'll move on and say, okay, it's not happening this year or whatever. Some players that will continue. Mike to, says, he says continue you, to work if with you, some guys want to prove, they want to prove they're a three point shooter. And usually they prove they're not. That's usually what happens. Uh, but he's open to yeah. those experiments early yeah. in the year. The other thing with Hall is that I don't understand is I've never seen Izzo let a player use so much one-on-one -on -one within an offense. It seems like Hall over four years has never been, they've never eradicated the rocker stuff, the, uh, the, the, the back and forth, the shimmy, the shake, and it, it stalls the offense out when he does that. Um, I don't know why they keep allowing him to, to play like that. It, it really, I've never seen Izzo allow that in, in his 27 years. Yeah, I guess Hall did do a little yeah. bit of one-on-one. -on -one. Izzo's usually not big on guys creating one-on-one, -on -one, unless you are, um, you know, Tyson Walker. Uh, you know, but Malik Hall last year playing some three. You know, they 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 opened the door a little bit of that to that. But you're right, he had he had more. It seemed like he had more of a free reign than Jaden Akins did, for example. I think Akins is going to have more freedom this year, and Hall is just going to try to find his comfort level. You know, last year Malik Hall shot 30% from three-point range, but earlier in his career shot much better. You know, tw the 2021-22 season, he was 42% from three-point range. You know, th this is a guy that can shoot 40% from three, which would be a huge help if he's able to do that and play 20-plus minutes per game at the four. Um, so Malik Hall is someone I watched very closely. You mentioned Kohler. Kohler did play at the four yesterday in practice. Um, you know, his perimeter shooting is... is has shown potential in the past. You know, everybody knows yeah. he's got a really slick low post game back to the basket. You know, he's worked on his face up game. It's something he he's always aspired to do. It's something he's always worked on. He showed it a little bit last year. If the shot clock was down, um, yeah. that's something that's needed at the stretch for Malik Hall shoots better than Kohler does right now. And I think Kohler can become a decent shooter at some point, but yeah. Kohler, the big question is whether he can move his feet on defense and play defense on a stretch four. I need you to turn down your your uh, your your tablet or your computer or your phone if possible because I'm because listeners are saying that they're they're getting feedback on that. So if you could do that, that'd be great. Oh, all right, sorry, I just switched I switched it off my car there, and, and I'm gonna I'll let you go get back to football. Ninety two degrees here in Austin. I'm gonna be up there for that Nebraska game with cold hams beer. A bunch of knockwurst, common knockwurst, nothing fancy, maybe a basic hot dog, and uh, probably carry a pretty good buzz in the stadium there. Um, I'm not big on drinking in the stadium, but uh, I'm big on you know filling up beforehand. So um, 
I'll let you get back to it, Tom. Thanks for taking my call. Thank you. All right. Um, I, 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 old Tuck is drinking all the proper fluids, eating all the proper solids, getting ready for game time. I respect that. And I respect him uh, and his opinions. I'm sorry with the feedback. I'm getting some some feedback about the feedback here in the comments area. It was a struggle here. It sounds like it was even more of a struggle for you guys. I apologize for that. That's the first time we've had that problem. So, old Tuck, you need to uh, learn from that, and I will as well. I'm getting some texts here that I need to check out. It's from someone who knows some things, so let's see. I'm reading something here. All right. All right. Uh, it's good to get some information. I apologize for that, but it, it, information is coming in every minute on, on some of these things, the coaching search and everything. And a lot of it's off the record, but a lot of it uh, helps me um, keep an eye on, on where things are headed and so forth. Anyway, hey, we're off to a little bit of slow start in some ways. It's kind of like we're getting a little bit of rain delay here, rain delay there, but we're going now. We've got question number two, Doc Spartan. Uh, he asks, what are you hearing about Urban Meyer? Well, he posted that yesterday. That was before, uh, you know, the, the Bruce Feldman uh, report came out. <clears throat> so the Meyer thing, to me, looks like it is done. Um, what do we have over here? Let's go over to the comments area. We'll do that in a minute. Let's go to question number three. Jim from Grand Rapids, Michigan. <clears throat> he says, is it a month? Um, it is a month yet to the first game, but where do you see? Let's see. All right. Um, Jim and Grand Rapids, it's a month yet to the first basketball game. Where do you see Michigan State stacking up in the Big Ten this year? Do you agree with on three's Big Ten power rankings, putting Michigan State number one in the Big Ten ahead of Purdue? Talk of Big Ten basketball. You know, a lot of people say winning the Big Ten is not that big of a deal, but it still is to Tom Izzo. They like to hang rafters. They like to keep players focused on a given goal during the course of the season. It's good to stay goal-oriented. It just it helps you in March if from day to day, week to week, you're trying to win a conference championship. Some media members, fans might not think it's a big deal, but internally it is. And for a lot of other fans, it is a big deal to get a trophy, put up a banner and all those things. Purdue won the Big Ten last year by three games of basketball, right? Um, and they've got five starters back, right? Including National Player of the Year, Zach Eady. Now they lost in the first round, NCAA tournament. Who beat them? Was it Fairly Dickinson beat them? I sat there and watched that game, and I can't remember who beat them. I think it was Fairly Dickinson. The amazing thing about that game is, I'd say late in the first half, you could see Purdue's players at courtside, their faces becoming worried. Second half, I was right by the baseline. Fairly Dickinson, or whoever it was, would score. Purdue would get the ball out of the net, give it to the guy to inbound it, and they looked like they were... Friday the 13th. You could see it on their face. And it, it's got to be hard to play basketball when you're scared. They were scared. Because you don't want to be... Let me see here. Hmm. I mean, information coming in from some people in the know. All right. So anyway... um. Can't tell you what that was all about, but it's interesting. All right, so I, mean, I can, but uh, I don't want to get people all, I don't know. Anyway, all right, it was it was an Urban Meyer thing, but we're moving on for now about that. Anyway, um, Purdue, no, I would, I would have Purdue as a favorite in the Big Ten. I do think Michigan State's good. And watching Michigan State practice right now, and I mentioned this, this to Izzo after practice, he has grown men on this team. Tyson Walker's gotten a little older. You know, he, he came here as just like, a, you know, spindly little kid. He's not a little kid anymore. A.J. Hogard has lost some weight, 
broad shoulders, big guy for a guard. He's always had power to his game. And I asked him yesterday, you've lost some weight. Power's always been a part of your game. And he interrupted me and said, I still got my strength. I haven't lost any strength. He's gotten some quickness. He's a grown man. Malik Hall is a grown man. Jaden Akins is a guy that has gone from youngster to man in the last six months. In his face, in his build, chest. Some of these players have re- reacted really well to the new, new strength coach, Lorenzo Guess. You can see it. In this day and age of college basketball, it's rare to have an older team. That used to be part of the secret sauce for Jay Wright and Villanova. Get old, stay old. Michigan State was kind of old last year. Almost went to the Elite Eight. Lost in overtime in the Sweet 16. I would say they were close to going to the Final Four last year. Maybe not that great, but they were close to doing it. They were older last year. Now they're even older, mature, with that experience. That doesn't guarantee anything in college basketball. I mean, things get random in that tournament. But it's a nice collection of players. I like Michigan State a lot. That being said, I've got to put Purdue number one in the Big Ten going in. Also, Michigan State and Purdue only play once this year, and it's at Purdue late in the season. That's going to be gangbusters. But that's an edge to Purdue, and we'll see what happens with with staying healthy and so forth. Question number four, Gas Station Coffee is his name. He's from Parts Unknown. He says, thanks, Cop. Any chance we use the bye week to prep a new starting quarterback at Michigan State or at least have even more, uh, even slip, uh, an even split of reps? Good question. I heard that the the reps with ones were evening out, even um, you know going into the Maryland game. <clears throat> so yes, I would expect that they could take this week and give Hauser, I think, more reps at the one. I don't know that this is happening, but give him more reps at the one than Kim to see what it looks like because you're not getting ready for a game. You can work on yourself during a bye week. I would I would think they would do that. <clears throat> and earlier I was saying I wasn't. I'm not. I'm not closing the door on Noah Kim like a lot of people are saying. And that was what I was talking about before old, before old Tuck called. I would caution Michigan State fans to not judge Kim based on those third down incompletions in the third quarter and the ineffectiveness of the offense in the fourth quarter against Iowa. They were trying to tail it to, uh, to uh, pare it down. Now, once the game was tied, then they tried to push it down the field and they had the... Um, I can't remember if that was the one when Trey, Trey Mosley broke had the, had the injury after they were already down seven. But, you know, they tried to push it down the field when it was tied. It ended up going three and out. And that was, um, you know, at that point, of course, they're not trying to be conservative anymore because they've got nothing else to to uh, to try to protect. So that, that last drive when it was tied... Uh, they had a play action come back to Montori Foster incomplete. Then they ran the kind of that new play, that delay sprint out pass where it's kind of like a play action. And then a delayed sprint out and on the run hit Montori Foster for a gain of seven. Noah Kim did. Then on third and three, that's when they had third and three. The ball was taken out of Noah Kim's hands. You had the false start from Evan Morris. Then third and eight, false start from Spencer Brown. Then on third and 13 against that defense, incomplete, you know, throwing to uh, Mosley on a comeback. Come back. They kind of had a, a levels concept, kind of a flood. The three over to there to the left sideline, incomplete. But they go from third and three, Noah Kim having a chance with a tie game to maybe maybe put together a drive and two false starts, take, take the ball out of his hands. Nothing, Not his undoing. Prior to that, he's trying to be safe with it. I'm not saying he's great. I'm not saying he's better than Kate Hauser. I'm cautioning people not to look at the ineffectiveness of the quarter of the offense in the late third quarter and most of the fourth quarter as an indictment on Kim because he was told to pare it down, be conservative, don't turn it over. Punt is not a bad thing. We'll see if he plays in the Rutgers game and if it looks any different. In the meantime, I, as I said in the VCast after the game, I was down on the field watching pregame. Pregame's not everything. But I mentioned in the VCast, you know, Nick Saban used to say, hey, you know, so-and-so had a good pregame, came out, didn't play well. So-and-so had a good pregame. We gave him a little bit more. He had a good game. He still says that. He watches pregame. Not that I'm Nick Saban by any means, of course, but coaches watch pregame and and what happens during the course of pregame. And I will say that Kate Hauser looked pretty good in pregame with his passes. And he's a young guy, Kate Hauser, redshirt freshman. And at his age, you would anticipate him getting better, you know, on a – bi-weekly basis, if not a weekly basis. That's just the way young athletes are. So 
he may be better than he was in August when he was auditioning for the job and fell short of Noah Kim. Now, Noah Kim, a lot of talent. I've said, and I don't mean to be disparaging toward him, but it does not. I, I have no doubt that he outperformed other quarterbacks in practice this spring and in August. We know physically he's he's worked on his body, but he's not the most put together guy physically. Did not react well to contact against Washington. Um, I don't mean this as a, I'm not trying to be funny or critical or make fun of him, but he is the best touch football quarterback on the team. But they don't play touch football on Saturdays. They play tackle football. And staying in the pocket when the to trust your rush is something he wasn't comfortable doing against Maryland and, and Washington. He was more trusting of it against Iowa, which I thought was a sign of progress. Late in the first half, that dig route to Montori Foster was was nice. And then he hit Foster two more times, got in long distance field goal range for Jonathan Kim, hit the 58 yarder. That dig against Iowa was important, impressive, and a nice step, staying in the pocket, getting it done. I do think he can build on that. I think he's shown poise, pocket poise, presence, improvement in a couple of weeks. However, had the interception in the red zone on the stuttering go to Foster on first and 10 of the 20 yard line. Um, throwing at Cooper DeGene, probably not wise. It's off coverage. Stutter and go against the off coverage. He didn't bite. Probably not a great play call decision and not a great throwing decision. Interception, lost three points there probably, if not a touchdown. Michigan State's had trouble turning red zone opportunities into touchdown with Noah Kim. That one hurt. That was one of the turning points of the game. State was leading 6-3. to three. Kick a field goal there. Kick a field goal there in a low scoring, low scoring game. Nine to three. Maybe you're onto something. You score a touchdown there, and you're up thirteen to three um, against Iowa and their offensive challenges. Would have been a big step toward victory even early in that game, right? Don't get those three points. Change of momentum. They had a little, little sneak route, rub route against man to man, thirty yards plus. Um, I think. 30 yards, plus 15 to Mise Adelaide roughing the passer. They're right back in business. Counter boot pass to the tight end for about 13. The counter boot for Iowa is something that they didn't do with McNamara because he's immobile. McNamara goes out. Deacon Hill comes in. He has mobility. That's an old staple of the Iowa offense. They run it with him. They can't run it with McNamara. How much Michigan State played defense in preparation for the counter boot? I'm not sure. Something Iowa has done for years. They've not done it this year because McNamara's been injured. I would hope that they worked on it based on Iowa's history. He came in, that, that plays right back in the playbook. Ference was talking about that, you know, there's some plays we can't do because of McNamara's problems with mobility. I would hope Michigan State prepped for the counter boot. Um on one or two, two of those passes, it didn't look like they were so great at it. All right, so they get a 32-yarder, the little rub route. Darius Snow falls down. Darius Snow playing hurt to an extent. Bless his heart, doing the best he can. They need him because they're low on linebackers. <clears throat> rub route, falls down man-to-man, 30 yards, roughing the passer, 15 more. Counter boot, another 15 or so. Then they get there, and then you know that little now route, the little tight end screen to Eric Ald, breaks five tackles, touchdown. Only touchdown of the game, I think, maybe, by either team. So you go from 6-3, maybe 9-3, maybe, you know, maybe 13-3 to momentum change, a couple of plays, and all of a sudden I was winning. So that turnover obviously was costly. Not only did it cost Michigan State points, it provided a spark for them that they carried over to offense. Huge play, not a good decision. You can even say not a good play call. I don't know. DeGene was licking his chops at that stuttering go <clears throat> in the red zone. <clears throat> One way or another, Michigan State's red zone offense has not been good, whether it be play design, play calling, or Noah Kim, or running game. <clears throat> All those things. So, um, yeah, Keaton Hauser, it would be interesting to see what he has for us on the outside. The coaches are practice every day. They see what's going on. They know what they have there. And Kate, Peyton Thorne uh, would be an interesting choice. Maybe he gets in there and he's ineffective. And then this is not talked about for the rest of the season. But until he gets in there, it's going to be talked about. Let's go over here to the, the comments area. Old Tuck, he was in first. And then he called the show. So we appreciate Old Tuck calling in on his lunch break in Austin. 
Eric Iverson says go green. Nolan Schroeder from Grand Rapids. Ben Chi. Coffee still. Still drinking coffee. Proud of him for that. James Bannon, he's got a question. We'll get to that a little bit later from Sterling Heights. Former Beaver Beaverton High School point guard. Beaverton, is that up there by Higgins Lake? Let me see here. We've got Stu Redman. He's around. Yeah, Beaverton is uh, just northeast of Clare. It is technically up north. There's uh, there's a singer-songwriter, I think, from Be Beaverton that mentions Higgins Lake, and I can't think of his name. He's, he's independent. He's not made it, but he's quite good. <clears throat> I think he's from Beaverton. Anyway, I'll look into that for you a little bit later. Zero Nine says, oh, look who decided to show up. Scrum and 85 says, hey, everyone. So the starting lineup, you got Old Tuck running the point today. I know I know, Old Tuck uh, is a big man at heart, but we need him running the point. <clears throat> I like his leadership. I like the fact that he showed up early and made the phone call. He's running the point. Iverson, he's my two guard. And we're running the Iverson, the Iverson cut for him. Slice cut over the left wing going to work. Eric Iverson is the two. Schroeder, he's the three. Ben Chee's the stretch four. And James Bannon's down low at the five. Old Tuck from Ludington says Brian Musalem uses social media daily up until middle of September. Is that noteworthy in your opinion? Uses social media daily up until middle of September. Um, I mean, he's he's noteworthy. Uh, I'm not sure about the social media aspect of it. Stu Redmond says he Stu, Stu Redmond says he denied interest in the OSU job when he was not coaching and was at ESPN. It's a great point, Stu. That's a good point. Um, I was not I was not aware of that timeline when he was working at ESPN and denied interest in the Ohio State job. Good point. In the meantime, all right. Uh, Adam Stevens says comp he denied the OSU job when he was at ESPN. You're incorrect about that. Uh, Rosalind Russell says Feldman was wrong about Tucker and LSU. Scrum eighty five says then why wouldn't Urban say it himself? Old Tuck says. Hall is not going to consistently make jump shots this year. Do you see Kohler sliding to the four? We talked about that when he called. Malik Hall had a good practice yesterday. I'm not going to be in the habit of talking to you every, you know, mentioning every time someone has a good practice. I'm not that guy. But Malik Hall, with the injuries that he's been battling, and last week, you know, I had some questions, but I just thought it was worth mentioning that Malik Hall shot the ball well yesterday, and I'm sure he felt good about it, and he should. That's just one practice. Doesn't mean anything, but he's been a guy that's been a 40% three-point shooter in the past, and I think uh, he's got the, the potential to do that again if he stays healthy. Now, as a matter of fact, let me just go ahead and... Um, while I talk, I'm going to go ahead and... run some video from yesterday. If I can find it, I had it right here a second ago. There it is. All right, so you guys can watch that while I talk. So this is not necessarily when he was making the shots that I'm talking about. This is the, the early stages of practice. They allow us to shoot some B-roll as it is, so you can check that out a little bit. Connor Theo says, hey, Count, checking in from Chicago. Eric Iverson also saying Urban told Fed Feldman he was not interested in the Ohio State job while not coaching before he took the gig weeks later. Nothing is certain. That is interesting. And I, you know, I was I had forgotten that part about the Ohio State job and Feldman because I wasn't really following it that closely. But thanks to those of you that are bringing that, that to my attention. That's the way it is in this day and age of uh, trying to be a sports writer and sports content provider is a lot of times people in the media or fans know way more than we do. And that's an interesting point. I did get a text from somebody that's in the industry, not in the media industry, but in the sports industry who says uh, the Feldman thing um, not my words but just kind of it's kind of a utilization type thing was Feldman utilized back in 2021 when he ran with the report um, 
rather frantically that uh, you know that LSU was very very interested in Mel Tucker. Was that utilization? I don't know. I, I don't. I, I honestly don't read a lot of his stuff. I mean, I know he's very. He's, he's got a prestigious job right now, and he's very well respected in a lot of ways. I'm not sure, but utilization does that happen in the media <clears throat> with with agents and so forth? Yes. Um, for instance, you know, in the NBA, the Woj bombs Wojnowski. He gets that information from agents, and he's done a great job with that. So in the meantime, do agents? expect things to be pushed to help clients in other ways at other times. I'm not saying that happens with Wojnarowski, but these things happen. So is utilization taking place here? I don't know. I mean, my initial thought when I saw that report, my initial take that I, that I wrote over at SpartanMag.com was this should douse speculation. That's what I really thought at the time. I still do, but these things make me pause a little bit. Some Some texts I'm getting and the point about Feldman and Urban Meyer at Ohio State and what turned out to be disinformation back then, if I'm reading it correctly. I wasn't aware of that. <clears throat> I can only tell you what I see and what I know as I go. and that's what, So I'm learning things while on the air here. Um, as for Urban Meyer, you know, a lot of people were saying it was never going to happen. It was just clickbait information. I said at the beginning of this show that it was more than that, that I'd heard from good sources that there were factions at Michigan State that were interested and um, the interest there was some the interest was being reciprocated to an, to an extent in terms of listing and so forth and you know and you know whether it be boosters or MSU officials there was some interest there that does not mean the entire Michigan State operation was interested there were some that <clears throat> hadn't yet come out against it it hadn't gotten to that point but um, there were legs to the smoke there a little bit. Just like there were legs to the smoke, so to speak, if I can mix metaphors, back when Tom Osborne was interested in 2000, 1999. I mean, going way, way back, there was, you know, there was, um, there were indications, you know, you know, going back to 95, Rick Neuheisel, Bill McCartney, things like that, that, you know, some of these things, there are coaches that are interested. All right. What do we have here? Spartan AG 999 says, go green. I can't wait to watch this basketball team win a bunch of games. It's going to be fun. Ben G says, no matter what Feldman says, the urban, the urban story is not dead in my opinion. Kalo Malo Ding Dong says, um... Why was he on campus on Tuesday? There's no reason for multiple sources to make that up. Tom Helderman says, oh, uh, only believable new coach talk comes from you, Comp. Keep it up. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate your support. But in this case, things are happening quickly. They happened quickly yesterday. They happened quickly the year before, the day before, the week before. Uh, I don't know for a fact that he was on campus. I've, I've, not seen, I've not seen any indication that was the case. Old Tuck from Ludington says, Strayhorn's podcast people say, says he cut ties with Musalem's people a while back. Strayhorn's podcast people. Do you think there is any significance to that storyline? I don't know much about that. I've heard things, but I don't know much about that. Clark Marier says, go green, checking in from Monroe, Michigan. Groove Spoon says, love in the early afternoon live. Uh, thank you to Groove Spoon for everything Groove Spoon did as an important piece of the live music fabric in East Lansing in the 1990s. So thank you, Groove Spoon. You don't have to thank us for a, an afternoon Spartan Mac Live. Thank you for all you've done as one of the great bands in East Lansing in the 1990s. Old Tug says, Urban Meyer ain't coming to East Lansing, folks. It's time to focus on somebody else. J.S. says, interesting about Urban and Ohio State job. Ronnie says, Coach, we need a, he says, Comp, we need a coach as soon as possible. Settle down, Ronnie. It's going to be all right. Have some dip. H. Maurice says, why would Meyer want to get involved with what has become a dumpster fire? Um, <clears throat> I, you know, <clears throat> it's a good question. You'd have to ask whether you think Urban Meyer wants to coach again and which jobs would be open to him. I mean, let's just speculate here. If Urban Meyer, does Urban Meyer want to coach again? <clears throat> I suspect he might want to. 
He just coached in 2021, right? He may not want that to be the last thing he does as a coach. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what do you want to coach in college? Of course, because NFL is closed to him. Is he ever going to coach again at Ohio State? No. Is he going to coach at Michigan? No. Is he going to coach at Notre Dame? No. Even though Notre Dame thought they were going to get him when they fired Ty Willingham. <clears throat> he ended up taking the Florida job. <clears throat> Is he ever going to coach at Florida again? Uh, probably not. Is he ever going to coach? Would he want to coach in the Midwest? I suspect so. SEC, maybe. Tennessee, is that job coming open anytime soon? Doubt it. Michigan State is not Ohio State. Is it close enough for a coach with an ego to think he can get something done there? We know that, uh, you know, he was very interested in the Michigan State job way back when he was at Bowling Green. He knows what Michigan State's about. He's been in the stadium. He's seen it when it's lit. He's lost to Michigan State a couple of times. Once in Columbus, once in Indianapolis. So if he wanted to coach again, I could see where he might think that it's attractive and maybe not the dumpster fire that you think it is. It is a dumpster fire right now with what Mel Tucker did. It is a dumpster fire in terms of some of the uncertainty with no president and the NIL situation. You're right about that. Would a coach of his ilk think that he could go through that with no problem and get NIL going and, and, and you know, mobilize troops and, and take care of those things? Probably so. So you're right, it is a dumpster fire in some ways, and some coaches would not be inclined to entertain this particular job. A coach with a lot of ego that has done a lot of great things in the past might look through all that and say, I want a job, I can do it there, give me a shot. I'm not saying that's the case, but you asked the question why, and I addressed that a little bit. Um, I'm just looking at something right here to see if we need to ban somebody. Uh, we got someone called Riverfront 101 here talking. Is he saying that uh, <clears throat> his brother is on the team or something like that? Cousin. He says, I'm encouraging my cousin to jump in the portal immediately after the season. Um, he says, y'all can't have my family future in y'all's hands. We're out as soon as the portal's open. So go ahead and attack all you want. I don't expect much more from you. <clears throat> um, he says, bro, he's far about Miami of Ohio, he's far above Miami of Ohio talent and trust. We were all in, as I explained to him. <clears throat> this is business, and he has to understand his interest. Um, I, I don't know anything about it unless you say who your cousin is. If your cousin's a third stringer, <clears throat> I don't know. If he's a player, I don't know. He says Mel Tucker let us down. It's not his obligation to stay for your enjoyment, which I agree with. You know, a player doesn't need to stay at Michigan State for the fans. Riverfront 01 says, it's a few right now. They're offering big and we're out is all I'm going to say. At least he's waiting till the end of the season, honestly. Um, Riverfront says, I'm not going to say obviously, but I'm not capping obviously. Riverfront 101 says, it's a few dudes that may have my cousin help them recruit and they calling saying, it's no way they coming. Now the only chance they have is to hire is a hire that these kids may like enough to reconsider. Um, I, I, I take him at face value. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> this looks credible to me <clears throat> that this is a cousin of a Michigan state player. And um, it's, it's nothing that we should be surprised about. If you're a player right now, especially if you're a long way from home, your coach leaves the transfer portal. <clears throat> is, is oh, this is that two twenty two thing, right? We're getting the national alert.
that was a national alert. That was the, the, the emergency broadcast system. We were told that that was going to happen, so your phone probably went off too. That was a test, and that was only a test. All right, so we'll move on. Let's go back here. to. But anyway, as far as the, the transfer portal goes, I want to finish that thought. It's obvious that if you're a Michigan State player and your coach is gone and there's uncertainty and the season is teetering and the NIL thing happened and everything else, of course, there's going to be players thinking about the portal. And of course, there's going to be family members that have an opinion on it one way or another. And sometimes a cousin has a, a big hand in that, and sometimes they don't. So we'll see. But yeah, I've heard, of course, there's, there's, I've heard, I've had, I've had, I've, I've heard that, uh, of course, there's, there's teams that are, have been reaching out even before the, before the portal happens. The question is, once you go into the portal, then teams can legally talk to you. Now, teams are already talking to players, Michigan State players looking through the roster and there's good players there to be had <clears throat> and there's nil offerings that are going to be out there as well so the question is if someone enters the portal are they still going to be on the team harlan barnett was kind of asked that after the game in iowa and he indicated that he's not interested in that being the case however if 20 or 30 players enter the portal you can't play football if 30 if you kick 30 players off the team for being in the portal the uh, the comparison was made to the, the bowl game, the Chick-fil-A bowl game when Michigan State played in Atlanta. And Michigan State had two or three players that were in the portal and Mel Tucker allowed them to play. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, there's a little, you know, Barnett said it was a little bit different. It was the end of the season and those players, some of them were on the field goal protection unit. So they didn't, so they allowed them to play, which I thought was, was, um, it was a unique move because the portal is still new, right, in some regards. Um, I thought it was a charitable move by Mel Tucker to allow those players to play. Michigan State utilized them, and they, they moved on. Uh, that was one game late in the year. This is different. You know, how many, what, five, six, seven games to go? Barnett indicated that if people entered the portal, he would not be inclined to keep them. But like I mo said a moment ago, if 25 players go in the portal, you can't play with air. You know, you can't go to the Air Force Rules intramural team and pick players up to finish the season. So that's a that's one of many rock hard play situations that Harlan Barnett is in right now, and he's doing the best he can. He's trying to help the program, trying to help these this team and these players, and things around him keep making his job more and more challenging, including injuries. Of course, Jacoby Winman out for the year, Trey Mosley injury situation has not been reported um, by the by the team. Of course, they're not going to until right before the game, but. I'm not expecting Trey Mosley to play anytime soon, maybe the rest of the year. That's not confirmed. Um, but my point is Trey Mosley was one of the best leaders on the team. Winman, one of the best players on the team. You lose your head coach, all these other problems, and your two best leaders get injured. Harlan Barnett trying to hold it together. Um, tough job. Tough job. Let's go back over here to the mailbag. Bob in Asheville, North Carolina says, uh, whoever the new coach is, what would be the main things you would be looking for if you were hiring the head coach? That's Bob from Asheville, North Carolina. You know, a lot of people talk about assistant coaches. That works sometimes. I mean, that worked with Oregon right now with Dan Lanning. That looks like that's going pretty good. He was a coordinator at Georgia, young guy, dan dynamic guy, a lot of personality. I mean, he was sniping at Deion Sanders a couple weeks ago. People have different opinions about that, but he strikes me personality-wise is somewhere between Nick Saban and P.J. Fleck, and that's a volatile mix. Also did a good job as coordinator at Georgia with great talent. He's off to a good start at Oregon. Cristobal left him with good talent there. That looks like it's a pretty good hire. People in the inside coaching ranks thought that he was pretty good. As far as other coordinators go, you know, when Michigan State hired Mel Tucker, one of the candidates that that search firm utilized or put forward and, and interviewed was Brent, Fry, Brent Pry, who was coordinator at Penn State, then a year or two later, he becomes head coach of Virginia Tech, and he's not off to a great start there, although he did beat Pittsburgh last week. That was with that search firm. It's my understanding Michigan State is usually use, utilizing another, a different search firm in a different way this time. I mentioned earlier on SpireMag.com that there was not going to be one utilized, but there is one in terms of <clears throat> just amassing names and doing some vetting and things like that, but it won't have as much of an impact 
as it was in that firm in terms of you got to need to take a real close look at this guy. It's going to be a little bit different from what I understand, but I will look into that a little bit more closely as we move forward in our coverage, trying to find out what's going on with the coaching search. So Brent Pry was a, a quote unquote hot coordinator at the time, maybe not fan wise or media wise, but coaching search firm wise, he was. You can say how you feel about that. Other coordinators that have come from Ohio State, Ash went to Rutgers, didn't do so well. Now they've got Shiano. So, you know, Mel Tucker was pretty much hired based on being a coordinator at Georgia. Spent one year at Colorado. He was not hired based on Colorado. He's based on being a coordinator at Georgia. He was the coordinator when Lanning was linebacker's coach. Essentially, Tucker was a coordinator hire. Had one year of experience. Um, for this program at this time, so the Big Ten starts to get tougher. <clears throat> You're asking me what I would want. I would want someone with head coaching experience. You know, there are a lot of people talking about Brian Hartline. Maybe Hartline will become a great dynamic coach at some point. He's been a great recruiter at Ohio State as a wide receivers coach. He's been a great recruiter of wide receivers. Mel Tucker was a great recruiter at Georgia. Was he recruit? I think it was recruiter of the year one year. Recruiting in Georgia, recruiting at Ohio State is different than recruiting at Michigan State. If it's an assistant coach, I would think it would be someone who knows a lot about Michigan State. That's why some people were talking about Matt House two weeks into the into the opening. He's defensive coordinator at LSU, but he's the defense at LSU this year has been a weakness. He has a good resume. Linebackers coach with the Chiefs, Michigan State graduate, Michigan State of Michigan native. That puts him on the radar, makes him someone of interest, makes him someone that would be interested. He's a coordinator at a big-time job. However, it's not going well at LSU this year. Not going well at LSU defensively this year. Gave up 600-plus yards against Ole Miss. Had a rough go of against Florida State. I watched every down of their game against Arkansas. That was Dan Enos against Matt House, and I gave the edge to Dan Enos. I mentioned that here last week. Defense is not going well at LSU to the point where he is being criticized. So that hurts the resume. What happens this season is a big bullet point on the resume. Your resume is your resume, and the most important thing in your resume is what you've done recently. Usually, coaching hires and coaching searches take place November, you know, late October, so that season becomes very important. This coaching hire, this coaching opening at Michigan State opened two weeks into the season. So the first thing we did as observers of this coaching watch is look at last year's records because that was the, they were the most recent bullet points, the most recent items on the body of work. At that time, Madhouse had been in LSU for one year. It had a really good year as defense coordinator at Kentucky. So his resume was interesting. But, but, that, but now, after three or four games, um... That candidacy has a lot, doesn't look as good, frankly. You know, I'll say right now that <clears throat> I remember when Michigan State, when, when uh, Mark D'Antonio was at Cincinnati and Michigan State had the job opening in 06, they were playing UConn and Michigan State was, or I'm sorry, Cincinnati was like five and five. And me and some people were at the Michigan State Breslin, at Breslin, Michigan State basketball game, and all these things were fluid. And there were other names involved, Brian Kelly. Todd Grantham, you know, there was there was some push for Charlie Baggett. I was interested in D'Antonio. I was impressed with what they did when they beat Rutgers and the way they beat Rutgers. Rutgers at that time was in the Big East. They were like 8-0, 9-0 in the top 10 of the country, and Cincinnati beat them um, very, much, very, very much in a trestle ball stylistic manner, which impressed me. I thought that was something Michigan State needed coming out of the John L. Smith era. That was impressive. To me. And, you know, I, I'm just kind of looking at other candidates and I'm like, man, D'Antonio would be really interesting here. He doesn't have a great in, he doesn't have a great record at Cincinnati. But if he loses this game to UConn and it was tight, I'm like, I can't see how they could hire him. <clears throat> and um, you may remember that D'Antonio had told them that he didn't want to talk about the job until after the season was over. And I think that was fine with Michigan State because, because that resume was still being written. And they played UConn, and they were losing to UConn. And Cincinnati had the ball at like midfield, and it was fourth and six or seven with like a minute 55 to go. Cincinnati had all three timeouts. And you've seen D'Antonio do this. He punted. 
down like four points, minute 55 to go, punted. And I didn't know that until I watched the game a couple days later. Made a stop, timeout, made a stop, timeout, made a stop, timeout. They punted back. Cincinnati goes down, scores, wins. They go 6-5. and five. He gets hired. They lose that game. He doesn't get hired. I don't think they can trot him out in the press conference. I, I think it was it's, it's, it's that thin sometimes. Maybe not for all candidates, but... Well, they, they interviewed D'Antonio after that. If he loses that game, I'm not sure they go down there and interview him. I know it's just one game. It's just against UConn. Maybe they don't. I don't know. Anyway... The Matt House stuff, his candidacy has gone downhill. Hey, Narduzzi would have been very interested in the Mich- this Michigan State job this year, this time. He was last time, too, but he had to pull out because he realized he wasn't the number one contender. He didn't want to hang around and find out what happened with Fickle. He couldn't because, you know, there was a fire under his feet at Pittsburgh. He had to come out and make a statement. <clears throat> um, he would have been interested at this time. A lot of Michigan State fans might not have been for that. I know a lot of Michigan State fans were not for it. But he goes one and four now. He's out. Chris Creighton, he went nine and four last year. Maybe he's a plan C way back burner guy. If at Eastern Michigan he had gone ten and two this year, he's not. He's lost a couple of games. He's like he's lost some Mac games. They were not competitive against Minnesota. So the timing was good for him to possibly go from plan C to plan B. Hasn't happened. This year, what happens on the resume this fall matters. So the assistant coach thing, you know, Bill O'Brien's out there technically with the New England Patriots. How he does with the Patriots doesn't matter. His resume is intact. Um, whether he'd be interested, I don't know. Whether Michigan State would be interested, I don't know. House, not happening. He's not having a good season. <clears throat> um, I would assume. Other assistant coaches, Hartline, maybe interview him. I think Michigan State needs somebody who's coached before. And has had some success. And we've written about this at SpartanMag.com. The ability to get a player, a coach, who's had success at the Power 5 level is not easy to do. There's not a lot of them out there. Just look at the top 25. Uh, presumably, you want a coach that's in the top 25. I would, if I'm Michigan State. I want a Power 5 coach in the top 25 who's had success. Top 25, 15 of those teams have coaches that are untouchable. Why would they leave their places? You're not leaving Oklahoma and LSU, Texas, you know, Alabama, Florida, Tennessee, Georgia to go to Michigan State, obviously, right? So a lot of those are untouchable. Who is realistic that's in the top 25 right now? You know, you're looking at... uh, I got to send this text. Hold on. You look at the top 25 and coaches that are realistic and in the top 25, it's a short list. Dickert at Washington State, Jonathan Smith at Oregon State, Elko at Duke. Those are the three to me that stick out as top 25s that are realistic. I mean, I know... Fresno State's in the top 25. Tedford's doing a really good job there, but he's in his 60s. Not realistic, right? So it's those three. And then some coordinators, maybe. That's what it looks like to me in terms of what I would be interested in. Let's let it play out, see what Dickert becomes at, at Washington State. Very interesting in a lot of ways. Younger guy, Midwestern roots from Wisconsin. And also it's about timing. Washington State and Oregon State getting left out of the Pac-12. Pac-12 shutting down. They get left out of the Big Ten and Big Big 12 expansion. Finances are a big problem at Washington State and Oregon State. Everybody knows that. Those programs are going to have a hard time paying those two coaches. Dickert was asked about the Michigan State job earlier this week, and he gave a non-answer answer, which is what you'd expect a coach to say. I'm happy where I am, whatever, whatever, whatever. That's what you say. That's what he said. You don't have to be smart to know that he would be very interested in in a Big Ten coaching job. So, and interesting that Washington State beat Oregon State two weeks ago. I've not watched that game yet. I know we had big movie on last week. He was not impressed with the eraser relay aspect of that game in terms of the defense that was played. 
But then Oregon State goes out and shuts down Utah. I know Utah did not have Cam Rising, but still beating Utah, a very rugged Utah team, 21-7, was impressive for Oregon State. So we'll see what those two seasons, uh, what happens with those two seasons. They're both in the top 20. Oregon State had a top 20 season last year. Very hard to win there. Pac-12 is a loaded conference this year, partly because Washington State and Oregon State are good. Let's see what they do the remainder of the year. They, those two resumes are still being built. If they go on, if either one of those programs goes on and goes 9-3 and three this year, they would stay at the top of the list, in my opinion. Elko, I love everything I see about Mike Elko right now. I watched the first half of the Notre Dame game Sunday night, the second half of it last night, going over every play, looking to see what they did. So impressive. Um, in his mid-40s, played at Penn, was a safety, Ivy League guy, but he's got this Midwestern roughness about him, even though he's a New Jersey guy and he's coaching in the ACC his demeanor, I think, would go real well with what Michigan State's been in the past and what needs to take place at Michigan State. Defense, I mean, the one gap and the need to, the two gap with physicality. The coverages is part of their secret sauce. You know, combination coverage, they'll have corner going man-to-man, linebacker man-to-man, and a cover three, three over two over here, combination and, and uh, confusing opposing quarterbacks among the nation's leaders in scoring defense. And yards allowed, allowed per pass. Uh, and, and they're on the same page. You know, they're doing some multiple things in defense and they're not fooling themselves. And they'll do man-to-man and they do, they, they'll do cover two. When do they do cover two? Just once. They, 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 they put it on Notre Dame once. It was in the second half. It was the first play of a drive in the third quarter. I hadn't seen them play cover two the whole game. First play of a drive, boom, cover two, incompletion. Might have even been a sack. But multiple on defense, multiple coverages, multiple with one gapping and two gapping and they don't fool themselves without the greatest talent there. They did have that safety. <clears throat> Mauisi was his name. He was from U of D Jesuit High School in Detroit four years ago and Michigan State looked at him. I think it was 2019, D'Antonio's last class. And he was an in-state guy that, that had a good... And I, I remember writing about him. All of a sudden, Michigan State was showing interest. I looked at his film. I'm like, yeah, that guy's... That guy looked... If you told me he was a four-star, I'd believe it. I don't know if, you, if those of you that are maggers might remember... Guy's last name was M A U S I. And Michigan State didn't get him. Ended up being like a three star guy, but he was like a late bloomer, diamond in the rough, hidden type player. Not much notoriety at all. I liked his film. <clears throat> and I was like, yeah, if you told me that that guy had offers from everybody in the Big Ten, I'd believe it. <clears throat> at the time, Michigan State, I think, offered, and then Mac schools were offered, ended up going to Duke. Didn't. I forgot about him for four years. Shows up in the film. He's starting for Duke and doing a good job. Anyway, Cutcliffe recruited him. Elko's making use of him now. On offense, Elko, St. John's is his name. Kevin Johns, offensive coordinator. A guy from Ohio. Had worked with Brian, with Kevin Wilson. Brian Wilson, Beach Boys. Kevin Wilson, former Offensive coordinator at Ohio State, head coach in Indiana, spread tempo guy. They do that at Duke, a little bit of tempo. And, you know, Kevin John said that he learned a lot of that from Wilson, sprinkling in tempo at times and the effectiveness, how it can be effective at times. We've seen Michigan State try that. Duke will do it a little bit more repeatedly. They open the game against Notre Dame. I think seven of the first eight plays were passes, tempo. But they're a team that rushes for over 200 yards a game. They want to run the ball. Inside zone with physicality, counters with physicality, come out. Then they'll do, you know, multi-receivers like everybody else does and some Kevin Wilson concepts. They run the gamut. They are physical. They're multiple on defense and on offense. Kevin Wilson system with an Ohio guy. Other guys on the staff from Ohio. Offensive line coach. Cushing is his name. Used to be offensive line coach at Northwestern. Prior to that, he was tight ends coach at Northwestern and Superbacks coach at Northwestern. He's a Chicago area guy, was at Northwestern, O-line coach, became head coach at like, not Northern Illinois, but like Northeast Illinois for like three years. I didn't look it up, but he must have lo- must have lost and gotten fired. Went back in the assistant coaching ranks, was hired at Duke to be offensive line coach. So it's an offensive line coach. He used to be at Northwestern, a Chicago guy, Midwestern roots. Um, D-line coach, he used to be high school coach at Buford High School in Georgia. Um, one other guy had Ohio roots too. And 
one or two or even three coaches on that staff have lineage to, to Dave Clawson at, at Wake Forest, who I've got great respect for. Clawson has built programs at various places, Wake Forest, Richmond, Bowling Green, Fordham. And a number of these coaches were with Clawson. Elko was with Clawson at at least two or three of those stops. So I, I, I've got a, a lot of fascination and respect for Elko that he's been in staffs that had to build <clears throat> from that point. That was a great thing about D'Antonio. He was here at Michigan State day one of Nick Saban, saw him start to try to build. He was at Ohio State day one with Jim Tressel, was part of the building process there. Experience in being there for the build, I think, is valuable. Elko had that with Clawson at a couple of stops. He also was a coordinator at big-time places. Coordinator at Notre Dame, coordinator at LSU. That's why Duke hired him. So that's a case of a program hiring a coordinator and having success with it. Can Michigan State hire at a higher level, a greater level than Duke? Yes. And we did this study at SpireMag.com a couple weeks ago. We looked at the thirty, the bottom 34 programs in the Power Five. That's, you know, everybody outside of the top 20 programs, top 30 programs. Because you have your top 20 blue bloods. There's about 17, there's like, there's like, you know, nine or 10 super blue bloods and another nine or 10 that are like borderline blue bloods. The borderline blue bloods are Auburn, in my estimation, Auburn, Texas A&M, schools like that, Tennessee, on down to like, I, I, I put 20 in the blue blood category. I, I threw Nebraska in there and UCLA just to make it an even 20. And then there the next 10 in my estimation were like eight or nine or 10 schools that think of themselves as top 25 programs, and they are or are, are not, depending on what's going on at that school at that particular time. Michigan State's in that category, you know, between 20 and 30. Michigan State, Iowa, Wisconsin, Arkansas, South Carolina, Washington, schools like that, Oklahoma State. And then, in, in my estimation, the next 30, 30 to 64, that's everybody else in the Power Five. You know, Syracuse, Texas Tech, Oregon State, Kansas, Kansas State, those type of schools, everybody else, Wake Forest. I just categorized them that way, and then I looked to see where they had got their coaches. Out of those bottom 34, there was only one of, the, of those bottom 34 schools that they got their head coach from another Power 5 school, only one out of those 34, and that was Louisville who got Purdue's coach, Jeff Brom. The other 34 either, either elevated interim coaches or got – you know, assistant coaches, coordinators, position coaches from the NFL. <clears throat> Three of those coaches had Power 5 experience, Brett Bielema. But Brett Bielema did not come from a Power 5 school. He came from the NFL as a position coach to go to Illinois. And there was two other ones I can't think off the top of my head. Point is, the bottom 34, they don't hire, they don't have the power to hire established Power 5 coaches. Louisville did. They got Jeff Brom. He was a native son. He had co he had played at Louisville. He was coming back home. They got him. But of the 34 bottom rung, I don't want to say bottom rung, but they're the non blue bloods. They don't hire from you know proven Power Five sco schools. Michigan State, you can argue, is in the bottom 34. And if you do, you can say, okay, that would make two because they had gotten their previous coach Mel Tucker from a Power Five school, Colorado, even though he wasn't successful there. That's, but the pool doesn't dip that low. Duke got Elko as an assistant coach. In my estimation, Michigan State has benefited from watching Elko go from power job coordinator Notre Dame, power job coordinator LSU, on the job training Duke, successful, boom. That's, the, that's a guy that checks all the boxes. I'm still looking into him, but at, at, at first glance, and I've done more than glance, but that's what you're, that's the type of guy you're looking for. And they, they, I mean, you, you saw, you probably saw it. You may have seen the Notre Dame game. They were, a, Notre Dame was down 14, 13 quarterback Hartman scrambles on third and 18 or was it fourth down? Might've been fourth down in 15 or something like that. Tuck scrambles, picks it up. Then they go ahead and win the game. <clears throat> Duke very clearly nearly won that game. Now Duke's quarterback is injured. He's going to be out for a while. So that's going to hurt Duke in their overall record for the remainder of the season. It'll be interesting to see what impact that has on wins and losses and Mike Elko's candidacy. But Elko looks to me like 
<clears throat> an excellent candidate. And you can go a number of years and not have a candidate that looks as good as that, in my estimation. Other people might be looking at other things, but to me, you know, just in, in, impressive, impressive uh, in a lot of ways. Now, he was asked on the set of game day casually about the Michigan State job. And you may have seen that. It was, you know, they were doing this thing and they were like doing like a Joker's Wild thing for questions to come up. And a question comes up, oh, who's going to be the next Michigan State job? And Kirk Kerb, Kerb, Kerb Street's like, oh, I don't know. And he's like looking at Elko because Elko was off to the side at Duke University. This is being done at Durham. And um, I forgot that this thing was done. I'll rewind it, play it again. And, and Herb Street's like, oh, I don't know, you know, kind of points at him. And then McAfee, like, brings it to him a little bit more emphatically. And Elko, with no microphone on, they're surrounded by Duke fans and Duke, Duke students, like, shakes his head no and goes like this, which is what you do when you're coaching at Duke. And it's the biggest moment in Duke football history to have game day there. You're about ready to play Notre Dame. That's what you do. And then Herb Street's like, hey, I didn't ask because he knew it was awkward and and... I guess it's fair, but that's how that went down. What do I make of that? I don't know. I've heard that he that it's out there that there is interest. And if you are a coach, that's what you say. Now, um, I like Clawson a lot. I don't know what his ceiling would be at Michigan State. It might not be that high. I'm very impressed with what he did at, at Wake Forest. As a personality, I'm not sure he would want to come to Michigan State and deal with everything that's going on at Michigan State right now. However, I do think that Michigan State's administration would like a guy like that. I think he's a guy that all the board members would be impressed with, but I just don't think he would... I don't think he's into it, firstly. Secondly, I think he's a good 8-4, and 9-3 and three type of coach at Wake Forest. He's great there. I'm not sure how high his ceiling would be here. A little bit of a system guy. Offensive... I don't know if genius is the right word, but you know he implemented and designed the slow mesh offense which other teams are starting to use a little bit, and it's been effective. Credit to him. He developed Hartman. He goes to Notre Dame. He developed a Kenneth. Well, he had Kenneth Walker. Maybe he didn't develop him. Came to Michigan State, but he had an eye of talent to, to, to get Kenneth Walker when he was a low three-star. I think Clausen's great. Looks to me like he wants to just play out the string there, but, but I'm, I'm hearing he's not interested. Michigan State was interested initially, but there's not. Uh, I don't think there's a match there. I think Elko, right age, so you're asking me what I'd be interested in. You know, Dickert at Washington State, Jonathan Smith, Oregon State, Elko at Duke. Those are the three right now that are proving it at the Power 5 level. And Michigan State has the unique ability to entertain someone who has success at the Power 5 level, which I already demonstrated is not common for the bottom 34 in the Power 5. Michigan State is not among the bottom 34 in the Power th- in the Power 5, in my estimation. And if, those, and if coaches at those schools are interested in coming to Michigan State, that would further demonstrate that um, not easy to do because there's not a lot of power five coaches that are successful. It's a small pool. And then how many programs can plug from that pool? It's, it is, uh, it's smallish. All right, let's, uh, let's go over here to the comments area again. I was going through all the, let, let's see what's going on with, um, I don't know if I should revisit the... I forgot about the little drama that was going on with the player's cousin that was posting. Yeah, I'm going to turn that off for now because I, I forgot that it, was, that it was running a minute ago. All right, let's go over here to the comments section because things are happening every second. I want to make sure I'm not missing something. So this is why I, I usually like to do this show at night because usually by that time things have calmed down. All right. Um, All right, sorry for the delay there. Riverfront says most should transfer. This school is not ran optimally. 
Bottom of the Big Ten, he says. I'm encouraging my cousin to jump in the portal immediately after the season. Um, he's not going to say who it is, but... Mm -hmm. I'm kind of struggling because I think this is interesting and I guess we can we, I, I don't want to just sit here and read these things but I don't have time to read them it, it doesn't make for very good podcasting if I just if I did <clears throat> but I'm not dismissing what he's saying <clears throat> at first glance it looks credible there's always going to be players and family members of players that are frustrated with programs um, everywhere all the time of course, that's going to happen to Michigan State right now also, especially if it's a player who's not playing. Call from Shined Up Auto Detailing. To accept, press 1. To send a voicemail, press 2. Then he's got a commercial. <clears throat> um, hey, we don't have a producer here. You call in. You go right on the air. And not many people... I don't use that phone a lot for a lot of things, and I usually don't get many spam calls. That's a rare one. <clears throat> Sorry about that. I'm glad it was innocuous. Okay. <clears throat> I better just go back to the mailbag. I'm getting... St I'm getting bogged down on some of this okay trevor says there's a lot of trolls here i don't know let me see i'm gonna have to see who we have as trolls yeah trevor tell me who the trolls are and i'll go through and look at them Yeah, just go ahead and let me know in there and I'll, I'll go through and because I don't have time to read them all. Uh, sometimes we have um, someone keep an eye on trolls. We haven't had much of a troll problem in recent weeks. <clears throat> and usually someone else. We usually have we do. We usually do have moderators here that are checking in on trolls. But at this time of day, I haven't been able to get them and it's not been a problem lately. But. Go ahead and tell me who they are, and I can get rid of them. All right. Question number... Uh, uh, and you can agree with me or disagree with me about what I laid out, about what I would be looking for in a coach. Established coach at a Power 5 level. There's not many to choose from. There's three interesting ca candidates rising right now at the Power 5 level. Now, that you have to have some backups there because you don't want to get caught like Michigan State did last time. You have to circle back, and you're scrambling. So you got to have some backups. That leads to question number five. Bill from Gros Eel. Gros Eel. He says, Comp, do you think Jason Candle at Toledo or Chris Creighton and maybe Matt Campbell get serious looks in the coaching search? What's the earliest we might have a new coach announced? Um, no on Matt Campbell for the reasons I mentioned a moment ago. He's not been a successful coach lately. He's not off to a good start this year. I think they went four and eight last year. But, I mean, he was in line to be the guy if if – Harbaugh and Michigan. If Harbaugh and Michigan had parted ways in 2020 and, and Harbaugh was down to his last chip, he was on the ropes and they managed to weasel out of the Iowa game and the Ohio State game. I don't mean to be insensitive, but I'm not buying what they were selling at that time. If they play those two games, I think Michigan goes two and six and Harbaugh might have gotten fired. The word in the industry is that, you know, Michigan State had had some t talks with Matt Campbell and he would have been an interesting candidate at that time, but things have kind of hit a wall at Iowa state and what you've done lately is so important on your resume. So Campbell, I don't see, unless he turns the season around and goes on a run, I don't see him being a candidate. Same with Chris Creighton. He went nine and four last year at Eastern Michigan. That's very impressive. It's very hard to win at Eastern Michigan. It's arguably the worst coaching job in division one. And for him to work to, to win a little bit there, um, very impressive. I've seen him on the recruiting trail. I'm impressed with him as a person. And 
but Eastern Michigan's not having a good year, and what you've done this year is very important. <clears throat> Jason Candle had some trouble last week with Northern Illinois, but they're four and one. They should have beaten Illinois. They controlled most of that game in Champaign opening night. His candidacy would look better for any job if he were five and zero right now, as opposed to four and one. In the in the MAC, there's a lot of parity, and you don't normally see a team in the MAC go undefeated in the MAC. So as you know, Toledo's been pretty good, but I I they're they're going to have a hard time running the table in the, in the MAC if they do. And he goes ten and one, eleven and one, that would be impressive for him to to be a candidate for another job. I give him credit. He you know he took over for Matt Campbell when Campbell left Toledo, and he went eleven and two, nine and four, and he could have left at that time. He is, you know, he, he took over a winning program and kept it going. And then they kind of dipped back down to 500 for a couple of years. Then last year went 9-4 and four again. Now they're off to a, a good start. <clears throat> so he could have left at that time. I'm not sure what opportunities he had, but that's when you strike when the iron is hot. That's what, you know, Candle, some people would estimate he was a better candidate at that time with less experience than he is now. I'm impressed that they dipped down to 500 and now they're on the rise again. If they go 11 and one, he's an interesting one to have on that plan B back burner. Like in 95, when Michigan state hired Saban, they looked at Saban. They looked at Frank Ganter, who was an offensive coordinator at Penn state at the time. Penn state was 12 and 0 best offense of the country, best offense in the history of the big 10. President McPherson was the president of Michigan state at the time. Peter McPherson, he was impressed with Frank Ganter, the Penn State thing. We didn't know what we didn't know about Penn State at the time. And the job was offered to Frank Ganter. He turned it down. He was the top choice. Then Saban was second choice. The others, we talked about it before. Jim Tressel was head coach at Youngstown State at the time. They interviewed him. That's a good guy to have had in the back burner. Gary, uh, Black, Blakeney. Blackney was the coach at Bowling Green at the time. He was the best coach in the, in the MAC. He was like 11 and one. They interviewed him. Those are good guys to have in the back burner. As opposed to last time when they circled back to Tucker, Tucker had some, had some good resume bullet points and good references, whatever. The other guys were like, you know, Ash at Penn state. And I'm not sure what else they had talked to Narduzzi, but he, he dropped out. They didn't have much from, from what I could ascertain in terms of, Plan B's. Be good to have some plan B's right now. Look deep into those and have those just in case things break down with other people. Because you don't know what's going to happen with this president search and other things in the administration. Candle's worth keeping an eye on. Not as a plan A, but if he goes 11 and 1, you don't, it, it, it's good to have information on him. Brad in Austin, Texas says, can we get a real honest assessment of our NIL collectives and what happened on Friday? Um, you know, the Spartan Dogs for Life thing, taking away some of the contracts from some of the players. Now some of those I'm hearing are going back into place. But it was an ugly look in general for Michigan State to get to get behind Spartan Dogs for Life and then for that to happen. It, it, it seems like a lot of jerking around was going on there. Um, someone from Spartan Dogs for Life, I think, needs to speak on behalf of Spartan Dogs for Life because they, they put out comments, but it's not attributed to any human being. So... They need to get that part straightened out. Meanwhile, Michigan State has <clears throat> um, this is Sparta as a name, image, and likeness collective. It's not officially endorsed by the university. Um, could that happen at some point? Possibly. It's a nonprofit, and it, it's run differently, and it's real strong with Michigan State hockey and women's you know, and gymnastics, a few other sports, and they're doing r real well with some with some athletes could Michigan State utilize that in my estimation they could but um, good point there spunky um, but it's there and they're, they're I think it's complicated so to speak but it's there in place to be utilized if everyone can act like adults Question seven, Carlos in Alexandria, Virginia. Have you ever seen a two-year run of major injuries like this at Michigan State? This year is starting to rival last year with Winman and Mosley now out along with all the others. It has been bad luck. Good question. It has been bad luck last year. I've never seen anything like a defense having to start 27 different individuals on defense. Now there have not been as many, but it's steadily adding up, and it's not a team that can withstand a lot of it. They were thin at linebacker last week. Defensive tackles are getting thin. 
Mosley, and like I said earlier, the leadership of those two is is hurting. Question eight, Tim Reidinger from Ypsilanti, and I think I pronounced both of those proper nouns correctly. He says that Iowa game was heartbreaking, seemed like, Michigan State was going to do the unthinkable and had everything chugging along. How much do you think this heartbreak has crushed the team and killed their spirits? Is this team done? Have they given up? Good question. Fair question. I will say that this team has surprised me before. Not only this year, but last year, the collection of athletes. They've got a resilience to them. They showed it in the Iowa game. They showed it last year at Illinois. They showed it against Wisconsin. Um, can they keep answering the bell as they lose leaders? After the NIL thing happened, they lose their head coach. Week off now. Man, if they would have won that game, they'd feel so much better about themselves. They'd be 3-2 and two and, I'd, and you know, go to Rutgers, get a win maybe 4-2, and two, play Michigan, you lose. Okay, 4-3, and three, then you go to Minnesota, you're playing for something. It would have meant so much to get that win at Iowa. And I've seen some heartbreaking losses at Michigan State. Um, I, I've seen there's different flavors of heartbreaking loss. We all remember when Michigan State lost to... Wisconsin, Big Ten Championship game in Indianapolis. You win that game, you go to the Rose Bowl for the first time since 87. Huge disappointment. Um, I was not in the locker room after the game. Paul Konerdyke was. I was at the coach's press conference. He said everybody was devastated. There were tears, understandably. They, they rallied back and beat Georgia in whatever bowl game that was in Florida. I think that was the Outback Bowl in Tampa. Yes. Um, that was severe heartbreak to not go to the Rose Bowl back when the Rose Bowl was the meaning of meaning of life, the Rose Bowl at that time. That was heartbreaking. I think back to the John L. Smith era when they lost to Michigan in 2004. Drew Stanton, sophomore, running his own read option, having a lot of success, build 17-point lead. He gets hurt. Michigan comes back. Braylon Edwards, heartbreaking loss. I saw Dave Baldwin off as the coordinator after the game in the tunnel, and I'm not sure I've seen a coach on the verge of tears. I think he was at that time. Tough loss because that's a that's a John L. Smith team that was trying desperately to gain credibility and beating Michigan that day in Ann Arbor would have done a lot for him and that coaching staff. <clears throat> and that season, that season eventually teetered out and you know went 500 or so, didn't make a bowl game. And then the uh, Notre Dame game was it the year after? Was it 06? Was it the year he was fired? Michigan State blew a 17 point lead in the rain against Notre Dame. You remember that year? <clears throat> um, And those were different levels of heartbreak. One was a chance to go to the Rose Bowl. The others were a chance to really stake your claim and, and make a statement victory. And those were really had a devastating impact on the remainder of the season. They were trying to get a program together. This was different because, I mean, Harlan Barnett's not going to be the head coach. Maybe the players were thinking they were going to play for him and help him become coach. That's what players do in interim situations whether that was realistic or not probably not unless they had a storybook season but for Michigan State to bounce back from those problems and play with physical heart against Iowa a physical team and to out physical Iowa on the road was so impressive and they put so much into it and this was heartbreaking in a, in a different way because they're not trying to establish a new program like John L. Smith was they're not trying to take it to the nth level and get to the Rose Bowl as was the case that night against Wisconsin this to me in my estimation was about this group of players in the here and now and this coaching staff and this group of players that in my opinion it would have been nice poetic justice from the football gods if they would have let them win a game because they deserved it they played so hard winning that game would have meant so much to them this team that had lost their, their head coach and all the things that have gone on through no fault of their own um it meant so much. It would have meant so much for them to win that game and to merely get to three and two, get a, an off week after a victory, after an upset victory, double digit underdog at Iowa, a week off, you know, keep it together, go to Rutgers, and really, you know, who knows what would happen there? And like I said, maybe go four and two, maybe lose to Michigan, you're four and three, then maybe you take on Minnesota. They've been a little rickety. There's a chance to get to six and six, seven and five, and you're not saving Harlan Barnett's candidacy, but in the meantime for the program and these players get to a bowl game while you're looking for a new head coach. That'd be a perfect bridge of the whole situation. Even if you go six and six and you hire Mike Elko, even if you're in the quick lane bowl in Detroit and Mike Elko's there having left Duke theoretically, 
and he's on the sideline, not, not as the head coach yet. He's the coach in waiting. That's all positive. That'd be a perfect bridge. And that game was so close to getting to three and two and setting up that type of, you know, that, that type of scenario. And that hurt that, that loss hurt those individuals, maybe not the, the fans on a whole, because there's not a lot to gain this season, except for what I just laid out. But that was a heartbreaking loss for these individual players. They've been resilient in the past. Maybe they can step up again, but it's going to be difficult. You, you pose a good question, Tim from Ypsilanti, and I don't know the answer, but this is, a, this is a tough challenge for them. They've surprised me before. Now they've got an even tougher challenge with, with, you know, with, with leadership problems in terms of leaders getting hurt. All right. Docker from Tarpon Springs, Florida says, what is the critical timeline, in your opinion, to hiring a coach? so that the staff has an opportunity to salvage high school and portal recruiting? Good question. Very important question. Critical question. <clears throat> um, yeah, thanks, Trevor. I'm going to be... Uh, got an appointment coming up in early November. <clears throat> we'll see if we can get it checked out. Anyway, Docker, you know, timeline, I think... I, you know, I've said the Monday after Thanksgiving would be my timeline. Drinking problem. Um, season's over Thanksgiving. That Monday, if you can make headway right now in back channels with various coaches, finding out who's interested. You can even talk money on back channels, right? And when the regular season ends, theoretically, if you're coaching Duke, <clears throat> you're not coaching your bowl game if you want to coach at Michigan State. If you're coaching Oregon State, you're not coaching the bowl game if you want to coach at Michigan State. That's what Wisconsin did with Luke Fickle at Cincinnati. Did a great job at Cincinnati. You want to coach at Wisconsin, you bow out. You don't coach Cincinnati in the bowl game. We introduce you the Monday after Thanksgiving. For Purdue and Louisville with Jeff Brom, it was different because Purdue played in the Big Ten Championship game. <clears throat> excuse me, which was the week after the uh, Thanksgiving. <clears throat> and they introduced him, I think, on Friday of that. Apologize about that. Maybe, maybe it'll come back. I think, long story short, the Monday after Thanksgiving. Question 11. Joe from West Bloomfield. Are we done with the portal for now? Is everyone locked in until the end of the season? Great question. And Downriver Cousin, or whatever his name is, would tell you that uh, there's more heading to the portal. I've heard that there is one player who's been a starter who will be going into the portal. So, um, yeah, I think there will be there there will be some. And these next few days are critical toward that end. And they need to find out if they go into the portal, are they still able to, to, to continue playing? This is, you know, the portal is still somewhat new in college football. Coaching firings in relation to the portal is still somewhat new. <clears throat> Could we see a rash of 10 or 15 players leave the team in the coming weeks? I don't rule it out. I've not heard that that's, the pat, the, that that's a possibility, but I wouldn't rule it out, and that would be a sad commentary on college football. I would understand some players making their own decisions for themselves, but if you're playing now, that is your resume to try to get on a team in the future. And if you're a second stringer and you've not played a lot yet, it would seem to me you would hang on to put some film out there if you are interested in moving on. So, I don't know, but uh, it's so far for Michigan State, it's been, they've held together so far, but things could change. I've not heard that it's going to change in a wholesale standpoint, but I've heard at least one who's been in the playing group um, is likely to be moving on soon. Jay Bannon from Sterling Heights says, what do you see as the biggest problem for Michigan State men's basketball team? What's the biggest problem they will have in order to over that they will have to overcome in order to go to the Final Four? The biggest problem they'll have to overcome. I would say, <clears throat> um, you know, depth at the power forward position a little bit and staying healthy there. You know, Malik Hall, We've talked about him earlier. I think he's got a chance to be a good, have a, a good senior, a very good senior season, a Kenny Goins type of senior season. 
Um, you know, they've tried Jackson Kohler there a little bit. Can he move defensively well enough? They're going to be looking at that. He played some four in practice yesterday. Xavier Booker's around. He can shoot a little bit. He does some impressive things to the rim athletically with the ball. The other areas of the game need a lot of work. <clears throat> um, a lot of work still. He's made a lot of progress in the last six months. I was cautioning Michigan State fans about Xavier Booker, who at one time was ranked the number one high school player in the country in some circles. I think he fell like to the number 10, 11, 12 or something in the country. And last year's recruiting class nationally was very weak nationally. So being number 12 this year might be number 30 in other years. And that's kind of where I think he is. Um, high ceiling of talent, shoots it okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um very good straight line speed, good springs. Has worked on his body to get stronger. Lorenzo Guess is the strength coach for the basketball team now, and they've they've made progress with him. But Booker has a long way to go. He's a listener. It's, it's my understanding that he and his parents understand he needs a lot of work, and they're not like hurrying him to you know whatever, uh, you know, to move on after one year. He's going to be around. I think he'll be playing for two years at least. <clears throat> um. And that's if he keeps improving. But he's not an answer this minute at 25 minutes a game at the four. It's a lot a lot less minutes right now at this point. It's it's Carr, I'm sorry, Malik Hall, as long as he stays healthy. They're working on Kohler. Beyond that, Kohler's, you know, his lateral movement is a question at the four. Malik Hall's health is always a question. And Xavier Booker's not there yet, so the four... The stretch four, you need someone who's going to make three-pointers to make everybody, to stretch the defense and make everything else go. <clears throat> That's so important. Hall can do it if he stays healthy. He's been healthy so far, 100% health now. Keep your fingers crossed on that. The power forward position is the biggest question to get to the final four to answer your question. It's good right now, technically, and potentially with Malik Hall. If he's healthy and has a good healthy year and has a 40% shooting season from three-point range, then it's fine. It's a team with not a lot of weaknesses right now. I'm not saying they're strong across the board. I'm not saying they're the best team in the country. But to make the Final Four, they need they need that. Izzo was talking about rebounding needs to improve. <clears throat> he always says that. Ball screen defense needs to improve. He thought that defensively, they did not rise to the challenge against Kansas State in the Sweet 16. So he's thinking about ball screen defense. He talked about that yesterday in, the, in media day, saying we're going to have 15 different ways to defend ball screens. That's an exaggeration, but... He wants to tighten up those screws uh, to get that rolling. So he would say defense rebounding like he always does. I would say that, sure, you can get better there. Defense against Kansas State did suffer a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. I would say, but the power forward situation, Malik Hall stay healthy. The other guys need to develop. Be patient with Xavier Booger. Booker. Had a Harbaugh slip there. Uh, be patient with Xavier Booker. He never asked to be ranked the number one player in the country. Do not expect him to be Paulo Bancaro. Okay, be patient with him. Eric Lindblom from Livonia says, which one basketball player from Michigan State can the Spartans least afford to lose to injury this year? Good question, Eric. I would say Ty Tyson Walker, right? With all of his talent, ability to create his own shot, and you lose him, there's nobody else really that can fill in that type of guy that can also take over the the game at the point if Hogard gets in foul trouble or, you know, you know, has a tweak or something. Walker, I mean, Fears can run the point too. And Jeremy Fears, a true freshman, is terrific. Physically, he looks like a junior right now. He does not look like a freshman. Great leader. You know, questions about his shooting? Shooting's, shooting's going to be fine, I think, for now. And it will get better because he works on it. I mean, he was the first one there working on a shot before practice, and he was in there after practice working on his shot. Kalen Lucas used to be the same way. Alan Anderson was the same way late in his career. But Jeremy Fears, Izzo is very excited about him. Not only as a player, vision, basketball IQ, leader, Izzo is really meshing well with, with Jeremy Fears right now. So if something happened with Hogard, you know, Fears can... Hogard is great. He's very, very good and valuable. Fears is going to be very good and valuable. Walker can play a little bit of point if needed, but you know what Tyson Walker is. He's going to be even a better version of himself, I would think, this year. Uh, Jaden Akins is getting better. He's become a man physically. We talked about that earlier through the chest. You can just tell he's grown up. 
I've not seen it yet, but Izzo says he's been practicing at a phenomenal level. He'll be putting on the court a little bit more. He was not allowed to drive and create as much last year. He'll have a little more of a green light to do that this year. I've not seen that yet. I'm looking forward to seeing it. I did not see him practice last Monday because he was out for a couple days with an ankle injury. So Aikens could be better than I've witnessed so far. So technically, if Tyson Walker were to go out, maybe Jay Nickens could, in a different way, take on some of that create-your-own-shot offense. But Walker is the guy to answer your question. He's the guy they can least afford to lose. Even though they've got some depth there, he is that dynamic. Pierre St. Pierre in Washington says, if the guy were hired today at Michigan State, anyone as a football coach with the roster as is, what is your opinion on what this rebuild would look like? Is Michigan State worse off now than we were in 2020? What area would you address first? Um. And he's saying, I'm wondering how long it would take for this to be an eight-win year, uh, an eight-win per year product, and how far is this roster on paper from getting there? That's a great question. Um, if you just look at the roster, you know, first of all, we've got to find out who's going to be here. I mean, Don River Cousins talking about players leaving and stuff. The quarterback situation has potential, whether you're talking Caden Hauser or Levitt, if they stay. You know, running back, you've got, you got Nate Carter for a couple of years, and beyond that, questions, right? I mean, Berger's got more eligibility. Mangum's got a year next year, if he can use it. Running back looks okay. Wide receivers look okay. You know, can he hold on to Jerron Glover? I thought he looked excellent this year. Foster can come back next year. Wide receivers, I think, are okay, and I think they've got some good red shirts, if you can hold on to them. Assuming you hold on to these guys. Offensive line, there's some good prospects in there. Vandemark, Ethan Boyd, Wigginton. Braden Miller coming around a little bit. You know, Blackstock has another year. He's starting to look a little better. So there's there's some pieces there. And some other, you know, there's some pieces there. Even though they've not had the year that Kabilovic expected thus far, they did well against Iowa. Rushing for 160 against those guys is, is, is good. Quite good. Did not do as well against Washington. Terrible against Washington. Better against Maryland. But there are pieces there. Offensive line, the roster... Not bad. Defensive tackle's a big question. They've not recruited real well there in recent years. Last year went out and got three out of the portal. <clears throat> Van Sumeren, haven't seen him this year. That's an important one to build for the future. Derek Harmon will be around next year, presumably. And defensive tackle, those are the hardest guys to find, whether it be in recruiting or in the portal. It's hard to get good big people out of the portal. Michigan State went and got three defensive tackles out of the portal. Dre Butler, Jared Jackson... And Jalen Salmi. Jalen Salmi's dinged up. No one's really sure how or why or what happened, but we haven't seen him in two games. Andre Butler, I didn't think looked that great for Liberty in the bowl game against Jason Candle in Toledo, but he looked better for a couple games at Michigan, at Michigan State than I expected. Then he gets hurt. Jared Jackson, I told you not to expect much from him. He hasn't been much. So they go in the portal and they lose those guys, or they get those guys, and they lost to Sean Mallory and Jalen Hunt. I know Jalen Hunt, I always talked about his pilot light was always flickering, and they kind, of, they kind of lost patience with him, but he had talent. And they would not have beaten Illinois and Wisconsin last year without Jalen Hunt and Deshaun Mallory. So they let those guys go, and Mallory's getting a lot of playing time for a bad Arizona State team. Would they like to have Deshaun Mallory right now? Yes, they would. Would they admit that? I don't know. So quarterback has potential, running backs, whatever. Wide receivers look okay. Offensive line, there's some pieces. Defensive tackles, a big question for the future. Defensive backs look quite good if they can keep everybody. Uh, Jordan Hall, linebacker, looks good. You have Halliday next year for what it's worth. I think he lost a step this year by adding that weight. brulee has gone. winman has gone. Nate Ote, I mean, he hasn't played all year, got hurt in the spring game, has never really done much, and they don't have much else beyond that at linebacker. They've not recruited well at defensive tackle or linebacker. It's been a 4-2-5 program, so they've not recruited a lot of linebackers. If I, I've not done the whole study on it, but it would seem to me that they've probably recruited too many defensive backs and not enough linebackers, especially with this schedule when you run into an Iowa or you're going to run into a Michigan and you're going to have to play a 4-3. I mean, Michigan State had five scholarship linebackers in Iowa City last week. One of them was Darius Snow, and he's hanging on by a thread. So they took seven linebackers. The other two were walk-ons, Sam Edwards and the Milliken kid from Grayling. Those were the linebackers they traveled with. One of them was Aaron Alexander, who transferred in from UMass. <clears throat> Michigander, who, who's played a little bit in some of the blowout situations and didn't look too bad 
you know, maybe he could go in and do some things if necessary, but he is like a, an inch away from playing. They had Harold Joyner at linebacker because they needed linebackers. They were giving him a shot at it in August, but now he's back at running back because they've been losing running backs. So uh, to answer your question, the roster is not great. It's not terrible. Defensive ends, they've got some good stuff there if they can keep those guys. So your question is, with the roster as is, what would the rebuild look like? Well, you factor in that, that we don't know what the, what the schedule is going to look like in 2025. We kind of do next year, right? Or do we not? I'm not sure with the Pac-12 teams coming in. So the the, the schedule is going to have a big a big uh, impact on whether they can become an eight and four program anytime soon. It's not bad at all if you can keep the, all those guys. There's something to work with there. And if a coach comes from a certain place, does he bring players with him? I mean, a coach coming from Duke's not going to bring many Duke players, I don't think, because those guys are different. All right. Question 15, almost done here. Uh, Green and White is his name. He's from Florida. He says, and I see that you guys have your own conversations going on over here. I've kind of had to take my eye off of that. Eye off of that, and I appreciate Noah going through and, and taking an eye about things. So there's been a lot of posts over here. I'm not going to uh, be able to get into all those. Maybe I will if my voice is still working in a minute, but let me get through the rest of this mailbag. The guy's name is Green and White. He's from Florida. He says, uh, we know D'Antonio is not running the defense, but it sure is an interesting coincidence that several weeks into his consulting gig, run fits seem to be much better on defense and coverage busts seem to be way down. Do we know if he's been working as defensive court quality control? Good question. Quality control, maybe so. I know that he was going through a lot of film and had some opinions. How, mu how much of his opinions are getting moved into it, I'm not sure. A lot of these blitzes do not have D'Antonio's fingerprints on it, and I've noticed improvement with blitzes and coverages behind them. You know, Chester Gimbro had a blitz sack from the slot area last weekend, and that was a zone blitz. It might have been a cover two blitz. I'm trying to go off to, I, I know they, were, they, they sprung some cover two at one point, so they, they bring the slot and it ends up being a four-man rush, and someone drops. I've, I've not gone back over the film yet. Drove back from Iowa City on Sunday. I've been working on some stuff. This is a, a rare week that I've not gone over the film yet, so I'm going on memory. And I think that when they brought a zone blitz and dropped into cover two, and they had shown, Michigan State had not shown cover two all night. So, you know, they got they got the signal in. They got the, they got the check in. The blitz came, and no one screwed it up. That's progress. They got a blitz. They got a sack blitz and a third down. That's great, right? Um, that does not have that. That that was that's a Hazelton, maybe a Salgado thing, and Barnett, of course. I know Barnett in 2015 when he and Tressel took over as co-coordinators at Michigan State, they morphed more to cover two on third downs. So I. I, I love D'Antonio and what he did at Michigan State, but some of the things they did well blitz-wise and having coverages behind them did not have D'Antonio fingerprints on it in my estimation. But quality control, does Barnett listen to what he says? Yes. And Barnett said that when D'Antonio talks, they've got a room full of coaches that are interested in getting knowledge from him. Most coaches are very eager to take knowledge from other coaches that have done it. And Hazleton um, does not have a big ego from what I understand. He is a listener and he would respect D'Antonio. So I don't have a, a, I don't doubt that he's been involved in quality control, but I'm not sure he's having the impact that you are insinuating. <clears throat> um, maybe he is. I'll keep my ear to the ground a little bit more and try to learn more. The run fits have been better. Stop the run against Iowa, which was good. Hey, Maryland's got a really good offense and Michigan State kept them, what, under 250 yards total offense. That was good. That was good defense that day, even though the score got out of control. They played good defense against Maryland. Lost that game, as everyone knows, by turnovers and not finishing in the red zone. Um, but yeah, you know, run defense has been pretty good. <clears throat> and the run fits gets murky when you're two-gapping because linebackers have to read and, and jump gaps and have a little bit more of a knack than if it's just one gap and you're going. If it's one gap and you're going, you have to bring another guy in and it makes you weaker in pass defense, theoretically. But it's been better. The last two weeks have been better. That being said, we all know Iowa's offense is terrible. So we will see what it looks like as they move into other opponents. Rutgers' offense, I've not looked at them yet. Not as bad as, it, as they used to be, but they're not going to be great on offense either. 
when they play Michigan. That'll be the real deal. Michigan's obviously really good in all aspects. Question 16 from Tampa Spartan. He says, is the Big Ten going to add Clemson and Florida State? I don't have any inside information on that one. I don't know. And as far as opinions go, I'm starting to like lose strong opinions on Big Ten membership and realignment. You know, I saw a post on the Underground Bunker message board today where someone says, you know, how many how many teams do we need? Talking about the Big Ten. How, how many do we need? I can't remember if I posted this or not, but I'm like, the word we, in my estimation, is out. The Big Ten is no longer a we. It's, it, the Big Ten no longer exists as we grew up with it. It's no longer a Midwestern entity. You might as well call the Big Ten the NFC North or Fox Conference North. I think I did post that. Call it Fox North. Um, there's going to be two conferences. Everybody knows it, SEC and Big Ten. There might There's a third one. There's, there's the ACC Big 12 stragglers that are still going to be around and they're going to be somewhat important. But at some point, those are going to be divvied up whenever the Big 12, whenever the ACC dissolves. <clears throat> so I don't know what the, the figures are financially. <clears throat> if Clemson... Florida State have to pay money to get out of that contract. Does it make more dollars and cents to pay that money and then get it back from the Big Ten? Does the, does Fox subsidize that move that, the way they did with the West Coast teams? I go back to what the, the former president at LSU said when he went to Oregon. He said, someday we're going to have two conferences, and those two conferences are going to be ESPN and Fox. And that's where we are. So winning the Big Ten... It's going to be very difficult. I think in the future, you know, right now you're measured by if you win the Big Ten, kind of. You're, you have been over the years. You know, D'Antoni gets hired. You know, we, we'd like to go to the Rose Bowl. We're going to go, we want to go to the Rose Bowl. Perla said we are going to the Rose Bowl. It's all about the Rose Bowl. You could go to the Rose Bowl and be ranked number eight or nine in the country. As long as you won the Big Ten, that was a great season in the Midwest for most programs if you went to the Rose Bowl. And that was the case in the 70s with Ohio State and Michigan, even though they'd go out there and get their tails kicked. Just going to the Rose Bowl was it, and everybody was was built to believe that was the end-all, be-all. And it is a beautiful thing. Not anymore, obviously. I think in the future going forward, winning the Big Ten won't be the measuring stick. The measuring stick will be getting to the 12-team playoff. And if you finish in the top three in the Big Ten in the future, I think that in most years, top three in the Big Ten will get you into the big into the playoff. And then from there, you go to the playoff, and your season will end with a loss. And if you do that too often, people will start saying, well, you can't win the big one. And increasingly, 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 we have these definitions on coaches that just um, lead to failure, 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 failure. I was talking about this with someone yesterday. Anyone remember, if you're old enough to remember, the 1990 season at Michigan State? Four-way tie in the Big Ten championship with Iowa, Michigan, and I think Illinois. And Michigan State, four-way tie for the Big Ten. So I got a piece of the Big Ten. Perlis did. And um, that team in 1990, I think, beat Michigan, narrowly lost to Notre Dame, tied Syracuse, I think. Lost to Iowa. And went to the John Hancock Bowl, which is currently the Sun Bowl. John Hancock Bowl was second-tier bowl, but one of the better second-tier bowls around that time. Played USC, USC with all the... uh, notoriety and everything. Notoriety is not the right word. That's a negative connotation if you if you look it up. With all the publicity USC had, with Todd Marinovich as the quarterback, he had all kinds of publicity coming in. Michigan State hit hard that day. I, Quinella, and those guys shut um, USC down. Won a close game like 1917, typical Pearl's hard-hitting game. Very good win. For Michigan State fans, that was like a great win. Beat USC. Beat Marinovich. Hit hard. Want to share the Big Ten? Very good season. Not a great season, but very, very good season, 1990. I think Michigan State finished that season ranked number nine, number like 17 in the country. 17. And that was considered a very good year. And maybe it's a shame that demands are such that something like that these days would not be deemed a very good season. Perlis used to say it back then that he liked, that he, he didn't really like the playoff idea. You know, Perlis would say, I like the idea that you've got 25 different bowl games, and you've got 20 different, five different programs that can win a bowl game and feel good about it in the offseason and win a t-shirt and wear a t-shirt that says bowl game champions. You know, back then, it's simpler times, but that's an example of it. You go to the John Hancock Bowl, you win, it's a successful season. 
in this day and age, that Michigan State team would be considered an NIT team. You're not in the top 12. You're irrelevant. That's what talking heads like me are going to say. So I think that's kind of not good, but that's just me pounding sand and yelling at clouds as an old man. All right. Ronnie M68 says uh, he's asking for a way too early prediction. He asks, will the women's basketball team and the men's hockey team make it at the NCAA tournament this spring? I don't know enough about the women's basketball team. I'll have to check it out and see where they're going. I, I am hearing a lot of good things about first year coach Robin Fralick. We will see. Um, it's a good hire. It seems in a lot of ways by Alan Heller on that one from what I'm hearing. But, you know, of course, everybody's undefeated till they get going. Big Ten is tough. We'll see with women's basketball. Hockey team, I think so. They begin this Saturday against Lake Superior State. I hear it's close to a sellout for Saturday afternoon, 4 o'clock at Mon Ice Arena. And then Sunday at 4 o'clock, Mon Ice Arena. On Saturday, they will be dedicating Ron Mason Rink at Mon Ice Arena. A lot of old-timers coming back for that one. Um, Michigan State hockey is one of the youngest teams in the country. Also very talented. Big Ten coaches have voted Michigan State projected to come in third in the Big Ten. They are number nine in the preseason polls, for what it's worth. A lot of talent, 15 new faces. So we'll see on Saturday what it looks like. But I do think that they'll make the tournament. I'm I'm impressed with Adam Nightingale and what he did last year with, with the team. They'll be faster this year. Can they come together as a group? Hey, that Big Ten schedule, everybody in the Big Ten has resources. Everybody in the Big Ten has tradition when it comes to hockey. The schedule's very hard. And it's not quite like SEC baseball, You hear, but it's similar. You know, SEC baseball coaches, they talk about in the SEC, the regular season, every weekend in the SEC in baseball. Every weekend is like a regional final. I mentioned that to Danton Cole once, and he said, yeah, that's kind of the way it is in hockey. You know, you're playing Notre Dame in a weekend, it's going to be tough. You're playing Penn State in a weekend, it's going to be tough. You're playing Michigan, Minnesota, every, I mean, they're all tough weekends. And usually in the Big Ten standings, everybody's around 500, and there might be one team at the top like Minnesota that's like got a, an excellent record. You look at the NCAA tournament last year in hockey, and the Big Ten teams ran rough shot over the opposition in the first round. I think it's going to become that increasingly. So if you get out of the Big Ten, um, if you're not too beaten up in that sport, you're pretty darn good. So... But you have to finish in the top three in the Big Ten usually to make the tournament. It's going to be tough to do that, but I think they will. Top four maybe gets you in. But yeah, I think the hockey team's going to get in, and it would be a disappointment if they don't. Again, 15 new faces. Have to wait and see. Question 18. I think we got just three or four more questions. His name is Sparty from Pauly's Island, South Carolina. He says, which Michigan State assistant coaches do you think deserve to keep their jobs? And do you think Nick Marsh would stay if the new coach kept Courtney Hawkins? Great question. I think Hawkins is most likely to keep his job. I think some of these, you know, some of these other coaches will get jobs elsewhere. You know, Kapilovic was pursued by USC a couple of years ago. He'll get a job somewhere. I've heard people say, with this staff, you know, how many of these coaches would actually get jobs elsewhere? Which is a tired old question from the D'Antonio years. This staff does have coaches that would be that would that would that would get jobs elsewhere. Selgado, the defensive backs coach, would get a job elsewhere. Kapilovic would get a job elsewhere. Hawkins can do whatever he wants. Hawkins, I mean, I would think Hawkins would be attractive for the next coach to keep around for a lot of reasons. I think the I think the wide receivers group is, is looking good. I think he does a good job with them. I think he recruits well. I think he evaluates well. He's an in-state guy. I think he's got a lot of values and former Michigan State guy, all that stuff. If if he were not retained He's not a guy that's coached in the college ranks in the past. Would he be willing to leave the state of Michigan to go elsewhere? Maybe not. He might want to go back to the high school ranks and ride it out there. Um, D-line coach Deron Reynolds is, you know, he's been bouncing around. He'd bounce. He would show. He would get a job somewhere else. Ephraim Reed, the running backs coach, I think he's got a bright future. He'd get a job somewhere else also, and eventually work his way up to the Power Five level as a running backs coach. So yeah, this this staff has guys that would get jobs elsewhere. Uh, Hazelton would get another job somewhere if if he were not retained. <clears throat> Assuming he wouldn't, if Dickert's the head coach, I don't know. But Hazelton has been a position coach in the NFL. If he's not a coordinator at the Power Five level, he would he would at least become have the cachet to become a position coach in, in the NFL. So if you think these guys aren't going to get jobs anywhere else, like Chris Smeland or something, um, you're wrong. These guys would get hired. 
All right, question 19. Uh, Thermo, he says he's posting from the bushes outside of Urban Meyer's house. He said, what's the reason for allowing players transferring out to remain with the team? Good question. We talked about that earlier in the show. The reason to remain earlier in the w- remain with the team, that was done for the bowl game. That was a one-off. Harlan Barnett says that was a one-off, and he's not interested in, in, in entertaining that as an option this year. However, I said that if players leave or enter the portal, and if it's a big number of them, if you're the head coach, I don't know how you can dismiss them. You can't just you're gonna run out of walk-ons at some point. So it's a it's a it's a delicate situation. I don't have the answers for that. Question 20, Jason from Crozet, Virginia says, if you were to put all Michigan State players into the draft pool, who would be your first pick in building a new roster for the new coach, so to speak? So more years is sort of more value. Okay, good question from Jason from Crozet, Virginia. Very uh, creative question. So who on the Michigan State roster, if I could keep one player and start in order, who would I keep? Let's wait and see what the quarterback situation looks like. By the end of the year, I might say Kate Hauser. I might say Levitt. I'm not sure. For just next year, and even for the future, I would incline to say Jordan Hall. I think he's a good player, very high character, um, physically capable as a freshman, smart leader, runs well, good player. I think Jordan Hall is the guy. Secondly, he's valuable, valuable even more so because they don't have a lot of linebackers around him for the future. So Jordan Hall would be my answer to that question. Question 21. This is the last question. Lee Gauss from Flossmore, Illinois says, I am impressed. Actually, this is not, we've got two more after this. He says, I'm impressed so far with the lack of opting out and into the portal, but it is, it is early, he says. Any rumblings? Are there any rumblings of others soon to follow? Good question, Lee. Well, we've got Downriver Cousin talking about it right now, or whatever his name is, saying that a lot of people are going to go. He's Sounding, you know, tornado warning sirens about it. I don't know. I know that players are getting um, approached by other programs. I said earlier that there is one player that, uh, that's that been a starter in the past that, it's my understanding, is going to be going to the portal in the coming days. Um, any rumblings on others soon to follow? I've not heard anything specifically, but it would not surprise me. I'm sh- they're, they're getting contacted. I'm sure they're talking amongst themselves. That's something Harlan Barnett has to keep a handle on. And Harlan, Harlan's doing the best he can to keep the, the situation together. <clears throat> and Harlan's a hard worker, and he's going to try to uh, keep this thing on the tracks and d- deliver the program down the road. You know, if you have another coach who's a lame duck, at some point do they just kind of, like, stop caring? That's not going to be the case with Harlan Barnett. I did think that John L. Smith became a little flippant down the stretch because he was fired but remained head coach. And you may, re- may remember... They actually played pretty tough against Penn State. John L. Smith was lame duck his last game, week 12, at Penn State. And they lost, you know, something like 24 to 17. They were competitive that day. Drew Stanton had been the, the quarterback most of the year, busted his helmet on a quarterback sneak against Minnesota. Minnesota won the game. Glenn Mason scored an extra touchdown, running up the score on John L. Smith. There was no love loss there. <clears throat> and then. John L. Smith went away from Stanton as the starting quarterback and finished the season with Hoyer. And I think Stanton was healthy, but he went with Hoyer. Hoyer was a sophomore at the time. Um, they went to Penn State, and Hoyer attempted, I think, 61 passes or something. And it was almost as if John L. Smith wanted to set a school record of some sort of pass yardage. or whatever. It, it seemed to me that, and they almost won that game, but it didn't seem like they were that that part of the decision was to win that day. It just seemed strange. You know, John L. Smith, and I like him. I got a lot of respect for him. I I like him as a man for sure. But that day, I think it became a little bit flippant. So anyway, I don't see Harlan doing that at all. He's going to try to keep things together as far as the program goes. But there are more challenges to come. He's got a tough job. And if I were to give advice to Michigan State fans, I'd say support him. Don't rip on him. They start losing. He's doing the best he can. It's a substitute teacher type situation. <clears throat> and he is, he's got a great resume. Former coordinator. Helped Michigan State go to Rose Bowl as a player. Helped coach Michigan State to a Rose Bowl as a coach. And he's doing what he can for the program. 
<clears throat> people get mad. Some Michigan State fans, and I've seen it on the message boards and on Twitter. Michigan State loses to Iowa. They're mad. They want to get mad at somebody. They want to voice disapproval and venom towards something. So they get mad at Noah Kim, and they get mad at Harlan Barnett. My advice would be save it. These guys are doing the best they can. They're still out there playing their best. You're obviously upset. Head coach Mel Tucker's gone. Can't yell at him anymore. Or you can, you can if you want to, but it's not doing anybody good to uh, to boo players or to to use social media in that regard, in my opinion. Do what you need to do, but that would be my advice. Question 22 from Tim from Marietta, Georgia. He says, what are your thoughts on reporters like Bruce Feldman? What do you take from his, re- from his reports? Um, I thought the LSU thing with Mel Tucker that was reported back then was seemed like utilization. Question 23, Rudy Silverdale from Washington says, I live in the Pacific Northwest. I would like to see us interview the Oregon State coach or the Washington State coach. All right, point well taken. Let me go over here to the comments and reactions. I think we're about done. It's 3.30 in the afternoon now. We're going to go ahead. and I appreciate everybody posting over here. I'm not going to be able to get through them all, but I uh, appreciate everybody checking in. Oh, Don Strait. Hey, thanks, Don. I didn't see that. Don Strait from uh, a local guy here. We always appreciate his support for sure. Let me see here. What do we have? We got a couple others. Trying to read that question, but I kind of lost it on the screen here for a second. All right. Okay, Don Strait. There it is. Don Strait. Thank you. It took me a while to find that. I was better at this, much better at this during rehearsal, but um, not uh, not when it's live. But Don Strait, thank you for your uh, generous donation in the tip jar here. Appreciate you, Don. Thank you. He says, uh, hi, Pope. For once, I will be able to stay awake for the whole chat. I know you wouldn't have a guess on the next coach is, but do you think, do you have a favorite among those candidates you have heard tell of um i would say uh, you know i mentioned it earlier but um mike elko looks yeah i talked about it earlier you may have seen it maybe you posted this before i got onto it but if you're new to this you can go back and rewatch this but elko right now is checking a lot of boxes i'm very impressed with him talked about you know, I mean, everything from his Ivy League background to just being a rugged type of guy that would work well in the Midwest. All right. Call from Nick Harrington. To accept, press 1 to send a voicemail. All right, let's go to Sarasota, Florida. Nick Harrington calling the show. Nick, how you doing today? Thanks for calling the show. Pretty good. How about yourself? Good. I was about to sign off and finish the show, but we will uh, extend it a little bit more. I was talking about Mike Elko again. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm just really impressed with what he's doing at Duke. Question is whether he'd be interested in coming to Michigan State. I've heard that he is, even though publicly he's saying he's got to say he's not. And he's going to be asked about it, and he's going to say not interested, because that's what coaches say. Dickert from Washington State right. said it. Dickert was less of a no when he said, I'm happy where I am, which is what coaches usually say. I think it's no, I mean, no one would be surprised if a a coach from Washington state was offered a big 10 coach coaching job and would leave. And no one would blame him for that, especially a Midwestern guy. So his no was a little less emphatic. Um, But Elko, I mean, we'll see what happens with the rest of the season. The the quarterback gets hurt. What's his name? Riley Leonard. I, I, I know his game. I can't think of his name, but got hurt at the very end of the Notre Dame game. Just the defense there, physical, multiple on the same page offensive line physical you know with the run game they want to run the ball but they'll spread it they'll go tempo with the kevin wilson type of stuff out of indiana with with john's the coordinator all of it you know how he presents himself in post game interviews ivy leaguer all of it um you know even 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 the gut the gut goes well in the midwest even that part of it i think is all right but we'll wait and see what he does for the rest of the season but elko the question was just posted you know, who, who I'm impressed with. I would say him and also Dickert and Smith out on the West Coast. Those would be the three, I would say, right now because they're all in the top 25 and they're young coaches that are proving themselves at a top 25 level at Power 5 programs. That's what I think you'd be looking for. Uh, what's up with you? 
Well, you know, just actually uh, just got off work and uh, I got a notification. I looked out on my phone and I saw that you were live. So I was like, oh, let me see if I can tap, catch this opportunity. But no, uh, everything's everything's going good, you know, down here in Florida. Weather's weather's starting to cool down to get to that just right temperature. Can't complain. Good. But um, yeah, I think I think it's people are looking for answers. Like they want they want that that piece of information or that, that tell that someone's going to, you know, make a hint that they're coming or not coming. But I think the only appropriate answer for, for even, even someone like Urban Meyer, who's, who's not currently coaching, you, you never are going to just say, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I would love it. I hope they call me, you know, I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm all in, I, you know, never. especially obviously if you're a current coach, that's, that's just the, the least unprofessional thing you could do. Even if, you do, in fact, have interest in, and would like to take the job if it was presented. But, uh, I yeah, I mean, Elko, uh, it's like like you were saying, he kind of fits more the the mold of kind of what we're looking for for not just you know can he win, but can he you know can he keep the the program in a, in a good light, and you know himself can he you know uh, can he be a professional football coach and not get involved in some of this nonsense Mm -hmm. but uh you know also wanted to uh talk about real quick is uh the hockey program and you know preseason rank number nine coming in with a lot of recruiting hype but they've, they've been living up to the hype you know they've been they've been getting guys that traditionally would not have came to east lansing and i think you know uh, all the upgrades at Mont Arena plus Nightingale and the staff that he's put together, I think we're going to see see some Ron Mason esque uh, times coming for the hockey program. And I just saw tonight that even uh, uh, Saturday is now officially sold out, aside from a few standing section mm-hmm. seats available for the Lake Superior game. Mm-hmm. So I think that that along with uh, you know great football basketball program is going to be. Uh, some some nice fresh air to be breathing after after this is going on. I agree. You know, I, I might go to those games this weekend, and it's it's interesting that the hockey season is opening during a football bye week. That's great timing, and to open at home is Absolutely. I think I think people are excited about that. The weather is good though, so going indoors at four o'clock in the afternoon for a hockey game that's a little bit odd. But like you said, it's sold out for Saturday at four right. o'clock, Lake Superior. Um, 15 new faces over there and, 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 you know, some, some highly ranked guys. I mean, the, the freshman, the, the six foot two guy from Belarus, you know, Leshinov, yep. defenseman expected to be possibly a first round draft choice next spring, 17 years old. I'm interested to see what he looks like. Six, two, he's got good speed apparently. And, you know, the other guy, Stur- then, Sturbeck coming in from Slovakia, six foot two, he was taken in the yep. second round last spring. Those guys, freshman defensemen, I have no idea what that's going to look like. You know, Isaac Howard coming in, he played for Nightingale with the U.S. national development team the program and you know he had six goals last year as a freshman at minnesota duluth joey larson coming in he's from brighton originally sophomore had 13 goals last year for northern michigan you know these are these are big time guys being added to the to the group they had some good holdover players and the goalie you know one of the you know the the best i don't know yeah maybe the best under 20 goalie in the united states best under 19 goalie in the united states maybe freshman you know he was committed not, to the, he was committed to the wolverines mention, he was a previous michigan commit right so a freshman, I'm, I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's it's interesting, and there is a lot of interest around here about it. And you know, there are people out here that are looking for a, a, a another diversion, as you can imagine, right now. But yeah, they they start Saturday and Sunday. I've not completely figured out my plans for the weekend, but I've got my eye on that for sure, as do a lot of Michigan State fans. Another question that I have for you that I I've personally been wondering. I mean, everybody obviously, who's going to be the head coach? Who's going to be the head coach? I know it would depend on who it is, but how much would we be able to lobby for some of the guys on our staff, for example, Courtney Hawkins, you know, uh, say whomever, say Elko takes a job. I'm assuming he would have some people lined up he'd want to bring bring with, maybe guys that he would go out and contact. But I feel like it would be really important and, you know, some some of the recruits, Mick Marsh has already uh, publicly stated, you know, uh, he, he doesn't know who he would like to see as, as the head coach at Michigan State, but he really hopes that whatever happens, that some of the staff, you know, remains. And I think he's talking directly to, you know, Courtney Hawkins in that mm-hmm. case. And 
I just was wondering, do you think that's possible that we'll be able to keep the at least the strong pieces, you know, home if, if somebody else comes in? The the strong pieces of the of the recruiting class. No, of the uh, staff, me, the coaching staff. Like, yeah. You know, usually, usually a coach, you know, only brings in, maybe retains one. You know, you know. Uh, right. Saban retained. Bobby Williams, and I think Pat Shermer. Um, D'Antonio retained Dan Enos. But usually only one is retained. You know, John L. Smith retained... Who did he retain? I'll have to think about it. But usually one. And Hawkins would make the most sense. I think the, the wide receiver position is in good shape. I think he's done a good job... Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, d- developing those right players, now, I mean, but but really... some of it will depend if a coach comes in. Uh, let's see, John L. Smith retained Jeff Stoutland. He retained Stoutland from the Bobby Williams staff, offensive line coach, and then Stoutland would have liked to have stayed at Michigan State, but D'Antonio was coming in with Roshar, and Stoutland knew that D'Antonio was going to be loyal to Roshar. D'Antonio liked Stoutland too. He'd worked with him in the past, but if the position doesn't match up, then you don't, then, you know, some guys don't get retained and, and and it's understood that way. Um, I, we don't know who the next coach is going to be. If the next coach comes in with a wide receivers coach that he is married to, like just loves the guy, then that would hurt Hawkins' chances, but we don't know who the next head coach is. Right. For instance, when John L. Smith came in here, you know Jim McElwain was his wide receivers coach, and he was coming with him. He, he had a lot of trust in McElwain. They were they were close, and McElwain was, was a very good coach. So it didn't matter who Michigan State's wide receivers coach was at the time. McElwain right. was you know that, that guy wasn't going to be retained. So we don't know who the next coach is bringing in. You know, who who that coach is going to be, and if and if he's married to a, a wide receivers coach. If not, and he's open minded toward that, I mean Hawkins is going to be an, an attractive person to retain. But we don't know who's coming in and what they have. I would think Hawkins right. would be the one. Yeah, I mean, I, I would think Hawkins would be the one that would make the most sense. The other ones are still trying to prove themselves. We'll have to wait and see. Right. No. Absolutely. And you know, I just I think I think Ephraim you know, Reed. I think Ephraim gonna, Reed. I think Ephraim Reed is an attractive guy as a running backs coach. Now he's he's from the yeah. South. He might be interested in going back in that part of the, the country. I don't think he'll have a hard time getting another running backs coaching job elsewhere. But the new coach comes in. I agree. Depending on who they have as a running backs coach in mind, I think Ephraim Reed is is impressive. And I could he's he's going to have a coach somewhere next year. Maybe Michigan State. Have to wait and see. Gotcha. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the the the, the success that some of um, uh, Coach Hawkins' players in the in the NFL, more most specifically Reed, you know, that, that speaks for itself. And I think that's just such a, a a great recruiting tool to have to have somebody who's put recent guys in the league that are thriving. And you know, I think that's important. <clears throat> but uh, also, I mean, one last question for you in regards to Elko. Uh, I mean, I've, I've watched some of Duke's games. Um, I've, uh, you know, it's, it's hard for me to really, to really pick and, and decide, you know, like figure out what, what their, their identity is as an offense. I mean, I know they're pretty balanced and they like to, they like to get the ball out, but I'm I, not, not that I want to go air raid, run and gun, but I, I just hope that whoever the next coach is, and if, if it may be Elko, that he's he's more, I don't know, he's more willing to bring in a coordinator who's more willing to open it up. Not to say that we have to abandon the run game by any means, but it just seems like, especially in nowadays football, and I know this stuff you know goes in trends, but right now the, the spreading guys out seems to be what the, the powerhouses are doing. Mm-hmm. Now, I know Michigan, you know, runs a, runs a pro style, but you know they're they're out of the shotgun primarily now. You know, like they mm-hmm. they still try to uh, spread it out as well. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. I think Kevin Johns, the offensive coordinator at Duke, will spread it out. And I talked about him earlier in the show. You know, he's a protege of Kevin Wilson, who was the 
who was offensive coordinator at Indiana. John's worked as co-offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach there, I think. And he's a practitioner, a lot of the things that Kevin Wilson did. Kevin Wilson would go tempo and spread it out all over the place to Indiana, if you remember that. And then Wilson was offensive yeah, coordinator. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. And he was offensive coordinator at Ohio State for a little while. Now he's head coach at Tulsa. Um, Kevin Johns has had a few different influences, but Wilson is among them. They will go tempo, up tempo. They will go spread. They'll spread it out, you know, three by one. They'll run the ball too. I think they're a, I think they're an optimal mix of physicality with the run and, you know, yeah. spread, spread with tempo. They, they, from what I've seen, they do the whole menu. Now they're not doing it with, with you know, Georgia's talent, you know, but. Um, right, exactly. I think I, I I don't think they I, I think that they're open minded to all of it, and a lot of coordinators a lot of times they like styles of offenses that give them the most trouble, um, and you know that's kind of what what uh, Luke Fickle's done at Wisconsin by going air raid, even though it's not like air raid like throw it all over the place. They are spread to run and they'll still try to run, but Elko I think he I think he wants type of offense that gives defenses the most problems in this day and age with the current rule right. changes. They did they do a lot of RPOs. They I mean they you know they'll they'll run zone, they'll run counters. You know, the the, the run game is pretty diversified. They'll do tempo. You know, they'll do power read option with motion. They did this play for their first touchdown, might have been their second touchdown against Notre Dame. It, and you could tell it was on their red zone playlist because it's not something they did I saw between the twenties. And, you know, they come out in their formation. I don't know what it was. It was like two wides, three wides, and they, they shift and trade in motion. And then and then when they get done trading and making the defense move, then they send someone in motion and snap it at a certain time and spring a guy wide open, wide open touchdown. It reminded me of Kalen DeBoer at Washington, the way they do the pre-snap stuff to get a pre-snap advantage, make the defense read and yeah. try it. And, and, and they make the defense work and adjust before the ball's even snapped and quick the ball comes out. It looked like a Kalen DeBoer type of play. And I thought that was like a red zone um, script play. And I was like, I mean, hey, I was impressed with every facet of the operation. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, all right. Hey, I appreciate your time. I know you guys over there at Spartan Mag always do a fantastic job. And I know in the uh, the Twitterverse uh, or Xverse, whatever, whatever it is now. Yeah. But uh, you guys are known as, as being some of the most uh, honest, you know, you know, forthright truthful reporters for for the university and we really appreciate that thanks a lot nick i really appreciate that <clears throat> it's a challenging job we do our best and we do strive for credibility and we appreciate you saying those kind words i'll pass it along to the guys all right yeah <clears throat> absolutely Thank thanks a lot nick there he goes and we're gonna wrap it up we appreciate yes, it have a good one thank you um we appreciate everybody that that uh, called and posted uh and joining us on a wednesday afternoon I got some more work to do. I might get outside and do a thing for a minute. And I got some th things to do tonight. It's a busy day. Uh, I had to do it in the daytime this week. Got continued coverage of Michigan State Basketball Media Day. Paul Conner Knight doing a great job with that. Jake Lascawa doing a great job. Kenny Jordan. Jason Killup, as always, with recruiting coverage. And Noah Sprunger with all the things that he does in, in front and behind the scenes. Certainly appreciate all those people and also all the SpartanMag.com subscribers. Go to SpartanMag.com, become a subscriber. We'd love to have you there as we continue to monitor the head coaching search at Michigan State. Also, give us a like here. Subscribe to this channel. We appreciate that you've been tuning in to Spartan Mag Live and we appreciate that you're those of you that are subscribers to SpartanMag.com. Sorry about my voice. Get over to SpartanMag.com. See me over there. Underground Bunker message board. We'll talk about it some more. Underground Bunker. Check us out. SpartanMag.com.